Julie has promised that he will have three balloons and a small sheet cake for us to celebrate. <laughs> I just, oh, saw, I just uh, saw the budget. And the budget, <laughs> okay, it's half a sheet cake. <laughs> no, it's, all, it's all sheet, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, seriously, it, it has been a, a long run for, for some of us and for many of us around the room, it's 20 years, but a lot of progress being made in this, our 20th year, having reviewed the slides, looking forward to the discussion that we have going on around the table. Let's go ahead and uh, get started with a, a quick run around the table, and then I have a couple of announcements, but let's get everyone introduced, and then we'll introduce those who are on the phone, or in fact, we'll flip it this time. We'll ask those who are on the, the phone or the bridge if you would introduce yourselves, TAC members. Mark Peston Comcast is on. Boy, you're not coming through well at all. Try it again. Maybe we'll do some sound things. Could on the bridge, could you just say your name again? Mark Hess from Comcast. Oh, Mark Hess. Mark, good. Yeah, it's <coughs> coming through really mushy. Sorry about that. Lynn Claudie, National Association of Broadcasters. Say again. Lynn. Lynn. Okay, Lynn. Lynn, Lynn Claudie. Yeah, I, we need to, for the guys in the booth, we need to work on our sound today because you're not coming through very clearly. But continue. Who else is out there? I was specifically, David Tenenhouse had said that he would be on, so either he's on mute or not yet on, but we'll look forward to his joining us as well. All right, taking the quick run around the room, first starting with our designated federal officer. Okay, Walter Johnson from the Office of Engineering Technology at the FCC. Michael Ha with the Office of Engineering and Technology here at FCC. Nomi Bergman with Advanced Communications. Jeff Forster with Intel. Jack Nishowski from Qualcomm. Lynn Merrill representing NTCA. Uh, Kevin Laddie, Charter. Steve Lanning, Visa. Carrie Kwapamakit, T Mobile. Marvin Serpu, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, serving as Special Counsel Lisa Guest, now with Cradle Point. Adam Drobot, Open Tech Works. Russell Jurek, Cisco. Brian Daly, AT&T. Marty Cooper, Dyna LLC. Greg Lappin, ARRL. Stephen Hayes, Erickson. Uh, John Chapin, Roberson Associates, representing National Spectrum Consortium. Rosal Riffi, Intel. Melanie Tiano, CTIA. And McNeil R. Sampson. Uh, Jesse Russell, Inc. Networks. Bob Havlak, FCC, Office of Engineering and Technology. John Barnhill, Alianza. Uh, Mark Bayless, Visual Inc. Frank Hornick, representing Paul Steinberg from Motorola Solutions. Pierre de Free, Silicon Federal Center, here is a special government employee. Uh, Dale Hatfield, University of Colorado. Ah, uh, 20 years. <laughs> Can you believe it? Can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it was just yesterday. Eric Berger, CTO FCC. Uh, Julie Knapp, OET. And I am Dennis Roberson, your friendly neighborhood chair for this group. Okay. Um, what Julie's whispering in my ear is that we, we have a, a new representative. Walter's hmm? whispering in your ear. What I said, Julie? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Walter. <laughs> no, they look alike, you know, these OAT guys. <laughs> Actually, you, usually for Dennis, it is Julie whispering. <laughs> but best not discussed here. No, 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 no. <laughs> this early in the session, we've already gone hill, downhill this far. This is pretty, pretty bad. I, I, I would like to recognize Jack Nitzelke for Qualcomm for providing us with the lunch today. Do appreciate that. And I would also like to recognize Russ just for being here. As you all know, Florence did a, quite a number on North Carolina, and Russ comes to us from the great state of North Carolina, and, and in fact, has many reasons why he should be there and not here, but 
he is here showing his dedication. So really appreciate that, Russ, the extra effort. In fact, I'd, I'd like to add, uh, Russ did not come here lightly. The, the Florence did not leave him alone or his family alone. So uh, he has uh, been impacted by the storm. So I, w I was frankly amazed to see him here today. It's nice to have power on water. <laughs> 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 and broadband, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Get to the really important stuff. All right, very good. So we have a, a full and rich agenda today, um, but just to get things kicked off, uh, Julie, would you like to open with a few words of, of wisdom, pearls of knowledge to share? Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll just be very brief. Um, impressed by all the work that you've been doing, <laughs> making uh, good progress. I think as I mentioned last time, uh, our hope is that we can get the, pr the presentations with the recommendations, or at least the recommendations, as close as we can to 30 days before our December 5th meeting. We have been keeping the Chairman's Office apprised of the progress in, uh, in, in, in all the work that's been going on, so uh, I have every reason to believe that we should be able to make the date. Beyond that, Nothing else. Now, and this, this is the, the interesting one for us as, as TAC members uh, at some periods in the past, not so recently in the past, uh, there was a concern that we weren't getting adequate interest on the eighth floor. Now we have more than <laughs> adequate interest. Be careful of what you ask <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so be very careful what you ask for. But it's, in my mind, it's really terrific because there, there is a, a great deal of interest in what we do on the eighth floor and of course that's what we're all about the, our tasks come from the chairman's office and our actionable recommendations go to the chairman's office so the fact that the chairman's office is also paying attention in between the point of insertion and the point of extraction that's a, a, a very good thing so we will we will continue to have that benefit for us. Um, I, I will say one, one more word uh, on the 20th anniversary. We are looking to celebrate this in an appropriate way, and, and figuring out that appropriate way is something that has been challenging. I had conversations, discussions back and forth with, with Walter and with Julie. I see I got them <laughs> figured out now. Um, and so we, we, we do need to sort that through, and what I would request if there are those who have really terrific ideas or have pictures from past days uh, at the TAC or things that you'd like to, to share or contributions you'd like to make, uh, please volunteer those. If you'd like to be part of a committee for this, I would be more than grateful to have that input as well. So that's something for you to think about and, and then you can get back to me at the, at the end of the session if you have ideas or in particular if you'd like to be involved in, in the organization because it's coming up fast, uh, just first week in December, this being nearly the end of September, only got a couple of months, even though we've been talking about it for a long time, to actually do something to, to have an appropriate celebration of that, that landmark event. Um, so, and there, there are a couple of other things that when we have such a committee that I'll share with the committee that will make this particularly special, but I don't want to spoil it for the whole group, so it, we have to focus on that. With that, let's dive in. Uh, as always, we do have a very full agenda, and we do have things lined up appropriately. This has been one of our great innovations for those who <laughs> haven't been paying attention so that we actually have the speakers set so that we can just go right down the line. It's a one of the huge challenges that uh, Michael and, and uh, those, well, Michael, I think you and James today, maybe Walter, uh, put this together, but in any event, we have the, the group uh, focused on our big data issues, computational power stress on the network in its formal title, um, but I will let the three of you sort out who speaks first and who follows and take it away. Okay, right. looks like it's Lisa. I think I drew the short straw, <laughs> or maybe the long straw. All right, let's dive right in. You get slides? They're up already. Okay, excellent. Um, so I'll just, this is our working group team members. No need to read all that. It's there for the record. Um, one, I want to go over, just read a couple of sentences out of our mission, though, because 
This is a mission that's been, um, let's say, it, it, a large mission and covers quite a few things. So just, and we've done a lot of research in this past quarter. Mm -hmm. But our, our mission is to do big data analytics, AI, augmented reality, VR, and it's emerged as critical tools. And we're gonna go into that in, in detail with a lot of uh, background data to talk about the extent of that. And I do have to say it's happening faster and, and uh, to a greater extent than I think many could have imagined 10 years ago. With, it, it can involve exchange of massive amounts of data across the network, often in real time, which again is, is an, another thing we're studying. We're gonna be talking about latency during this presentation today. And, and the, the real time nature, the criticality are, are all things that uh, are something that not only should the FCC pay attention to, but we have some recommendations at the end that I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go over some things to act on. So the task of our group is to study how all of this may be affecting network performance over the immediate future and, and uh, midterm future, and how are the ne network operators prepared to deal with it. So the next slide just goes into that with more detail, but I, wa I wanted to bring us back and remind us of the mission of, of this discussion today. As far as the agenda, the way we've broken it down are uh, we'll be doing a preliminary report for, the, uh, for work in progress on growth, trends, impacts, technologies, and then we'll describe some consequences and recommendations. So in this presentation, what we've done, we've, we've had quite a few presenters speak, and we've captured the essence of, of the, and the learning that they've all brought to us. So we've, we've it, it, and I've been on several work groups before. This is a really a, a very nice amount of presenta presenters we've had. And we've covered things all the way from blockchain, Bitcoin mining, uh, fog computing, edge computing, the evolution to cloud computing. We've talked to several industries. I'd like to point out we've talked to agriculture, healthcare, and several experts in a variety of technologies. I've mentioned AR, VR, 5G. So a lot of that learning is incorporated in, into our presentation. And for your reference, it's all here listed along with uh, URLs that can link to content from that presenter. So now I think I'll turn over to Adam and you can talk about growth as our first topic. Okay. So uh, I think to uh, you know, start off with, and I'm not going to go and read all of these uh, view graphs because we probably have more material uh, than we can go through. I'm shocked. Uh, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> I, I, I have to say, I, from last time, you recall, I kept us on time, so. We, we, we promised to be on time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, but um, <coughs> the, the first, the first uh, uh, statement to watch is that you know, digitization uh, is, and the innovation around it is one of the things that's driving network demand. Uh, and that that digitization and the innovation uh, minimally involves four things. It's communications, uh, which is what uh, this group is mainly concerned with. Uh, it does involve computing, uh, storage of data uh, in many, many forms, sensor resources. And I think the thing we'd like to get across is that when you start looking at practice from the viewpoint of the operators, uh, the folks who make up the market, the folks who are doing the investment, all of these things are very tangled with each other uh, in network service offerings. Okay, and uh, that affects business models, the policy incentives, investments, uh, you know, to be able to meet the demand. Uh, uh, I think there are some new emerging patterns uh, of, of how stuff is used, how the American population actually uses it. Uh, and then I think uh, the eye we have, uh, 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 you know, which is our sort of focus here, is to look at what are the breakout applications and technologies that could further uh, increase and exacerbate the level of demand on the network. Um, in looking at all of this, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the U.S. legal framework, uh, the uh, uh, am I keeping up with these things or not? Okay, good. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that's worthwhile sort of posing as a question 
is to look at the whole regulatory framework uh, and see whether the approach to policy makers, to policy making, actually recognizes the trend uh, and how digital product services and widely used processes are being deployed and used. Okay. And um, if you take a look at the packet-based network uh, uh, that lies outside the scope of common carriage, should the FCC explore how to adapt to the emergence of the new generation of information technology infrastructures uh, that now involve really all those four aspects we mentioned before, which are communications, computing, uh, storage, and sensing. Um, and I thought I would sort of start off with a very, very simple example. Um, if you take a look at, let's say, the proliferation of uh, uh, you know, cameras, uh, high-definition cameras uh, for applications, let's say, like surveillance, uh, you know, typical architecture is you take the payload from that camera, you go directly to the cloud, you might distribute it, uh, crunch on it, okay? And if you assume that the uh, material from those sensors has to reach the cloud all of the time uh, and is at full resolution, and you start looking at large numbers of cameras being out there, uh, you might come to the conclusion that uh, uh, what's on the network and the network's capacity okay, has to meet that, uh, that traffic. Okay. If you look on the right-hand side of this view graph, what you'll find is if you put in edge computing or embedded computing on the cameras themselves, a lot of the processing can be done at the edge, and it greatly reduces the amount of traffic that then goes to the core it reduces the demand on the network. And this is a simple illustration of how, for example, computing and storage okay, and the communication assets end up being intertwined with each other. So let's take a look at uh, uh, you know, what's actually growing on the network, how fast it's happening. And uh, I'm taking a, uh, uh, a view graph from Mary Meeker. Uh, she does an annual uh, report on uh, uh, sort of the status of the network. Uh, and what she is illustrating here is that the technological timelines for major developments uh, are in fact happening faster and faster. So one of the things that's uh, uh, in, in growth uh, is actually growth of the pace with which we're facing new things essentially. Uh, the second one is the gathering of data uh, from sensors of various kinds. Uh, this is real data on shipment of uh, various kinds of MEM sensors. Uh, again, really on an exponential, uh, on an exponential path. Uh, if you take a look at the creation of data, uh, again, exponential. If you start looking at the uh, uh, the patterns of uh, what it's being used for, I think you can see it on the, on the view graph. Everything from file sharing uh, to video data uh, uh, to uh, uh, transaction processing, essentially. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, the traffic pattern on the mobile aspect of this, again, it's something dominated by video traffic. Uh, social networking probably didn't exist on this scale 10, 20 years ago. Uh, still a good deal of audio, uh, but uh, web browsing, software downloads, file sharing, things of that sort, uh, increasingly uh, up there. If you then take a look at the underlying uh, technologies, let's say communication bandwidths, it's a curve that comes out of Nielsen. Uh, again, uh, fairly dramatic, almost growing at an exponential rate. And then uh, the growth in the number of connected devices. And uh, uh, the same goes with uh, processor power. Uh, and then the growth of large data centers in the cloud. Okay. So what you are finding is that growth uh, is really an underlying aspect, uh, I would say, of uh, uh, both the demand side and the supply side uh, in this industry, essentially. 
And uh, if you take a look at the advances in computing technologies that are driving traffic growth, uh, they're happening both in the fixed and mobile access. They are dominated by video-like services. Uh, and then they are fairly complex. There are lots and lots of issues that you can take a look at. I'm not going to go into detail, uh, but it is the format, whether it's short, whether it's long, scheduled, or unscheduled. Uh, Age-old question of symmetry of up-down traffic. Uh, I would say pushing more towards uh, being more symmetric than it was before. Uh, the need for ubiquity, that's uh, geographic coverage. Uh, the underlying economics of what uh, uh, is affordable and what's not. And then you see the move a lot of a lot of critical functions, I would say, to the network, uh, again, probably in ways we didn't quite ant anticipate. And then the last of these is the importance of various kinds of uh, attributes, which are becoming increasingly important, like security, reliability, latency, jitter, many of the things that are going to be covered in the 5G, uh, uh, 5G presentation. Uh, if you take a look at video, uh, and this is coming to trends, so I'm going to turn it over it's to Lisa. Okay. <laughs> yep. So, so let's talk about trends now. Um, that was, uh, all, um, well, yeah, I guess we have to advance. I can do that for you. There, thanks. Okay. So, if a lot of the things Adam talked about, we're gonna boil, we're gonna talk more about later in this presentation. So, one of them being video, we're seeing a, a, an absolute change in viewer habits. So, operators are having to convert from broad, uh, broadcast and multicast into unicast. So, this gets at the upstream downstream age-old question of how, how, how much is upstream, how much is downstream. We've, we feel like, and several of our cable operators on the team, that we're in the beginning of this transition. And this ongoing transition to unicast will require a substantial investment in the networks until we hit an inflection point and we're there. Because today's networks are largely designed for broadcast and multicast downstream. We're going to see a lot more upstream, a lot more very individual traffic flows. The growth in the traffic does increase both up and down, be more branching and build outs closer to the access point. So not only is it requiring more bandwidth at the core, but it also it, it will require more things to the home, to the endpoints, the growth of wireless, which will be a significant uptake by mobile and nomadic viewers and users. Our, our world is turning wireless before our eyes, and, and we're definitely seeing that as we have our guest speakers in and as we're talking amongst ourselves in the group. The video is increasingly embedded in content, whether that's video from the ads we may not want to watch or it's video that we do want to go see. And the, the capabilities are increasingly enmeshed in every product and service we do. So we, you know, we've all seen that chart where you go from plain text to graphics to you, know, you have color and now you have full video. That's just going to continue and probably at a faster rate. So on our next slide, we're going to talk about the, the rise of uh, cloud fog and edge services. So not only are we seeing uh, the trends on the last slide of the changes in video, a lot of other industries are creating the need for change. And computing and networking, we believe, is becoming tangled in a very fundamental way. And this, this the, the hierarchical or, or siloed way we have been looking at the network and at computing as two fundamentally separate things will no longer exist. <laughs> We'll have computing where it needs to be, and it'll be for a variety of reasons we'll go into later, but you know, largely around latency, security, bandwidth requirements, and capabilities of the network. So the, this is really going to drive, and it's, you'll see this show up in some of our recommendations at the end, so it will drive change. The value from the computing infrastructure drives many of the architectural investment decisions today and in the future, and the network itself is changing as a result. So we, we see a lot of virtualization in the network, we see a lot of, uh, you know, the node slicing we've heard about, NFV, network function, function virtualization, and the general softwareization of the network with commodity hardware and a, a software-oriented overlay that can change much more quickly than the today's more fixed hardware configurations we see in the network. And this scalability is going to drive hierarchy in the computing. It's a, 
assets and facilities that exist between the cloud and the edge. It's not merely a simplistic view that all compute sits in a central cloud. We're going to see this as, a, as very granular computing all the way from the cloud to the very end device. So on the next slide, we have uh, applications are increasingly woven into our society. So not only in my past two trends, we're seeing changes in video, changes in traffic patterns, changes in where computing lies. This becomes even more important over time as the applications are becoming not just nice to have, not something that people that want, you know, that have a phone have. It, it's, it's part of our life. It's our on-demand services. It's not just entertainment, but it's how we'll get financial services. I, I look at my son, and he has to do all his homework online on, you know, Google Docs. That's becoming a critical part of, of, of how life happens now. Public services, we see the, the uh, first responder networks emerging, the healthcare, education, and elder care. That's an, a very interesting notion we're going to be diving into more in, in Q, uh, Q4. You can tell I'm on the revenue side of my company. <laughs> <laughs> before the next session. But, but we think that's an emerging trend that will really change the, not only the quality of life for people, but just the economics of, of aging. And then here's a lot of, uh, several slides on the trends to really back this up. You've got, you see connectivity habits. And I, I have to say, I was actually a little bit surprised to see how high the percentage is of households with no phone, especially considering how often I have to give my home phone number on every form I fill out still. But 62% of, of children have wireless service only, not followed not far behind by the adults um, in, in that curve. And you can also see in the demographics of who's using it. And you'll see this trend in several slides I'm about to show. This younger generations, as they're emerging, are growing up in a digital world. And in fact, there's, you know, we, we, we call them, you know, they're digital children and they're growing up knowing how to do this. And that will drive a lot of network impact. The next couple slides, so if we go to the next one, the, the universality of Wi-Fi, that is showing up everywhere. There's hardly anywhere you can go you don't have Wi-Fi. And if you look at the applications requiring it with these on-demand platforms, this is something that's emerging in every part of our society, whether it's hotels or transportation, healthcare, entertainment, how we do business, um, how we, in retail, it's ubiquitous. Another slide that supports that, if we go to the next one, is digital services are, in, are a part of daily life. So this just supports the point I've already made between banking, uh, real estate, everything you can imagine is, is going to be transitioning to digital. And if you look at some of the tr other trends, you look at Amazon, they, there are some technologies we've noticed that are emerging that we don't quite yet know what will happen with them. Just like when a smartphone was invented, I don't know that anybody could have envisioned where we are today with smartphones and just how much they have changed our quality of life. Marty knew. We, we, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, we, I'd like to say always for the better. We can hope for that, but uh, that our smartphones have changed it. But the AI platforms with Amazon being a good example. Um, and, and that's part of what this work group is considering is there there are things we just can't know yet, but it's going to start accelerate on, on how these baseline technologies inter, interleave themselves into everything we're doing. And also on this slide, what I, I found this very interesting, our, the density of our population is quite a bit less than other industrialized nations. And that that is something unique to the U.S. and our solutions will have to fit our patterns. So uh, I'll give a little precursor to some of our consequences slide, but not to steal your thunder, Adam, but it's, it's something we have to consider of, it's not just where you have dense population that needs these services, everyone will need these services. And so just the last trend slide here, if we go to that. So really to summarize this particular bullet, what we're examining all these enablers driving the digitization of our products, services, and processes, and it's increasingly interleaved into everything all of us do, and it has deep impacts on our economy, on consumers, industry, public sector. It affects all of us. So these, these trends are precursors to the digital nation. So we, we anticipate a very digitally literate population that will access a variety of, of applications that range from entertaining things to do to life-saving critical things to do that will inc require increasing bandwidth, increasing uh, 
sensitive to latency and low latency, and that these technologies will have to evolve to accommodate for how things are changing. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Adam, for impacts. Okay. So um, what, what we thought we would do is take a cut at impacts and look at them um, in, in a number of different ways. Uh, and so the first one is use types, uh, things that require high bandwidth, uh, things that might require low bandwidth but come in large numbers, uh, sensi sensitivity to attributes, we'll deal with that again, uh, and those items which are essential for participation. So if you start looking at the consumer space, and this is just a characteristic list, it's not uh, prioritized, and there's a lot more homework to be done on it <coughs> uh, to make it a little bit more comprehensive, but in the consumer space, it's everything from <coughs> entertainment to gaming, uh, the emergence of AR and VR, uh, and then personal communications that involve video. Uh, if I take a look at things that are low bandwidth, large numbers, uh, it's transactions, shopping, the smart home. Uh, if you start looking at sensitive attributes, it's personal data, security systems, personal care, uh, and then essential for the population, everything from job hunting to education to social life. Okay? And you can do a similar cut uh, uh, for what's important in the commercial and industrial world. Uh, which is investing very heavily in these digitization technologies and driving some of the demand on the network uh, and very similar kind of things that happen in the uh, public sector. So they're there for the record. I'm not going to go through and read all of them. Uh, so the next item <coughs> is to take a look at uh, the same kind of picture as before, uh, but now ask, okay, what technologies are involved in all of these? So, you know, what's, uh, what is cloud and edge services? Uh, what do they affect? Uh, emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality, uh, and again, we're taking a cut at it, looking at that consumer, commercial, and public sector space. So again, these are examples. I think it's a work in progress. Uh, but I think in the least to sort of give you an idea of how pervasive uh, these technologies are uh, and how pervasively they're being used by all three sectors that we mentioned. And then I would say the last one, which uh, I think relates very much uh, to the 5G world, uh, is latency. Uh, in the consumer space, uh, uh, if I look at healthcare, uh, aspects of smart home, uh, less frivolous but uh, profitable things like gaming, uh, again, makes a tremendous difference. On the commercial space, the connected car, various forms of control systems, and in the public sector, uh, things like the new networks that are being built out for emergency response, and again, control systems, which are sort of less and less likely over time to get their own allocations of spectrum. Uh, they'll be sharing splices possibly sharing sp slices uh, with the rest of us. Uh, and then again, how do you do that in a way that preserves uh, important properties? Uh, bandwidth, reliability and availability, uh, and then uh, very important, the whole security and privacy regime uh, that goes along with it. Okay. So all of those are going to be impacted fairly heavily. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa to actually go over some of the underlying technologies. Great. If we could forward one. There we go. Back one. <laughs> Back one. Right. Back one. Um, so the technologies, we looked at a couple of things. Well, a couple of, of buckets emerged for us as we looked at all this data. So what, and we looked at it through the lens of what will this technology do for us and is it keeping up with the demand? And another thing that fell out of that with capability is, and, and as a, being an important thing, and I know important to many in this room, is it deployable in the right places? So not only in urban areas, but also you know, the settings that are rural, sparsely populated, suburban, and does it have the right bandwidth in those areas uh, and latency characteristics to suffice? Does it support industries where they operate? Agriculture, 
in energy and mining. And something that was really striking to me as we've had all these variety of indus industrial representatives come speak to us is how many of these industries operate outside of dense population centers. For the demand, you also have to look at, by, by industry and application and, and the space that Adam's already talked about and laid that out quite well, is what traverses the network? What will the, will the network support it? And does it have enough bandwidth? Does it have the right characteristics that we've already mentioned? Does it have the latency, the security and reliability? And then what drives the resources needed at the various points in the cloud? or at aggregation points? What can live at the edge? And then what has to actually live on a user platform? There may be ca cases where we do artificial intelligence on whatever endpoint that is, is there, and that suffices. So these are all, it, it's a, a very multi-dimensional uh, environment to look at. So let's go to the next slide and look at a couple of the technologies. Um, this, these are some representative uh, pieces that came from our some of our speakers that we had in our work group. So the AR VR space. So if you you can see on the right there's somebody wearing the goggles and I had Google Glass myself back when it first came out and <laughs> that was interesting but it didn't go anywhere but um, a, a lot of <laughs> I I think it was a precursor to how much this is this technology will be interwoven in, in our in our lives and in our industrial environment. We for example I repair I'll just look at that one for a second. We had someone on, on our talks, and they were talking about how AR and VR can really help identify where is there a problem and what should I do to fix it, and really make that a much more foolproof way to repair something, which I know I want when it's my airplane I'm about to fly on. So that's that's driving a lot of bandwidth. So that's, that's per device. That could be a, you know, massive bound bandwidth, and it has to be high quality because then the human factor gets involved. So with it so close, it needs to not be blurry. So it's high bandwidth. Another piece, if we'll go to the next slide, is artificial intelligence. Th this is, I mentioned that in an earlier platform and the, the work that some, some of the vendors are doing to develop very scalable, uh, friendly AI platforms. And this is just poised to take off, if, if you look at it. And in every industry, healthcare, autonomous cars for sure, manufacturing, financial services. It, it's hard to even imagine the limit to what industries and consumers will be able to do with the, the artificial intelligence technology. And then the cloud computing that we're seeing right now, this is, this is massive change that's going through all of our enterprise world as we speak today. Uh, hyperscale facilities being built and, you know, and hyperscalers that are, are really centralizing computing and you see there the graph on the you know everything's up and to the right certainly in this space and pretty steeply and then as I finish up this section you know a little bit more on cloud computing and just just more of the things that it enables software as a service platform as a service you can have infrastructure as a service we're, we're really heading toward a virtualized world which we can't get to unless we have the right elements of granular computing in the right places and the right networking elements that can support the connectivity required for this. And I think with that, I'll turn it to you, Adam, for consequences. Okay. Um, so I think the, 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 first, the first item is uh, looking at uh, applications uh, where there is a possible <coughs> expl explosion in demand, uh, but at the same time tempered by the fact that the technology uh, used appropriately can actually balance some of that demand, okay? And usually do it by doing a architectural trade-off between where you do computing, where you do communications, where you store material, uh, and where you have your sensing, uh, sensing systems done. And so if you take a look at uh, things that are fairly high up on the list, uh, I think uh, definitely the connected car <coughs> world. Uh, uh, on the uh, industrial side in manufacturing, uh, oil and gas industry, uh, we've had a number of speakers on agriculture, quite a bit there, uh, and the same thing in healthcare and education. Uh, and then if you ask, okay, what are the technologies that are actually involved in this? Uh, the first one is a uh, big deal with mobile broadband, more video, 
Uh, and then what I'm going to call the connected X, uh, that is connections for various kinds of uh, mobile platforms. Uh, the use of augmented reality, where traffic has to flow uh, back to some location, essentially, uh, so that the uh, material isn't just local. Uh, and then I would say a very important deal, and that is with all these hyperscale cloud facilities, uh, the bandwidth between the clouds and how they're connected, how they do settlements, all of those kind of things also matter quite a bit. Uh, the second category uh, are items that affect the nation's competitiveness, uh, the quality of life, uh, and national security. Uh, and those are sort of, uh, you know, the basic uh, uh, services we talked about previously, emergency services, and then services that lead to economic advantage and productivity. Okay, and this whole notion of digitization uh, if you take a look at uh, sort of economic statistics, do show up in those productivity me me metrics in a fairly large way. And those technologies um, are uh, everything from artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, data sciences uh, writ large, uh, the use of cloud and edge computing uh, in an appropriate way, uh, and then the proliferation of, of uh, sensor systems that generate the original data uh, from which you eventually extract value. And then um, number three on consequences, uh, and I'll use an example to, uh, uh, to illustrate this is, <coughs> you know, we have had patterns where investments have been driven by where the population is. If you go to things like connected cars, you don't want to come to the edge of the city and find my car doesn't function beyond that boundary. Okay? Uh, people drive all over the country. Uh, there are secondary, tertiary, quaternary roads. Uh, those are all important. They transport stuff. Uh, and so I would say an increased need for area coverage both on a functional front uh, and then I would say largely uh, to sort of avoid at second uh, uh, yet another, uh, uh, I would say, digital divide. Uh, is to be able to provide uh, those less populated areas with the kind of services that you can find elsewhere. And so good examples are health, education, agriculture, emergency services. And that means not only do you have to have the network, but you need the intermediate computing storage and sensor assets uh, that are part of these systems also. So to be able to provide the services on some kind of an equal footing. So with that, let me turn to the last item, which is recommendations. Lisa? So our first recommendation <coughs> is to promote competitive and balanced infrastructure services that will preserve economic leadership of the U.S. And, and how? Partner with other agencies to develop a strategic policy plan and roadmap for a digital nation that incents adoption and deployment accessible to all citizens. So, so that's the first recommendation, is, is really to, to foster this competitive environment that does get the ubiquity of the connectivity and compute that's needed and with the right characteristics. The second priority here is for the FCC to determine how to carry out its mission now that we, ta we have this notion of the tangling of commu communications with computing, storage, and sensor. This is a recurring theme that we noted during nearly every speaker we had is, is how compute and the network is, is, so, is starting to become so intertwined. I, I talked about that, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. And how would we do that? We're, we're recommending a dedicated study group for this topic with a specific mandate in this area and provide input by the end of 2019 to identify responsibilities and or, or suggest responsibilities and scope of what the FCC should and is authorized to take light on light in light of changing technologies because <coughs> if, if you if you look at the world things are changing rapidly and the FCC needs to take a look at what how do we change with it or do we need to change with it so that's that's really what we're saying with this second bullet and then finally, create and encourage practices and structures that minimize the divide between underserved areas of the country and urban centers, such that all are in a desirable place to live and conduct their business. 
So develop and prioritize policy options that address the challenge, providing economically viable services to rural, sparsely underserved areas. And, and as we put, be part of the digital, the digital nation. So with that, I think we are finished and ready for questions. Let me just make one short announcement. Uh, we had a request for those on the bridge, if you would go on mute, there's some leakage of the presentation um, back onto the bridge itself, and some people are having problems hearing. So everybody on the bridge, if you can go on mute, unless you're gonna speak, thank you. Okay, are there questions? We use our standard format. Questions, comments, put your tent card up, and <coughs> Pierre, you are first up. Thank you, Dennis. <coughs> Amazing presentation, thank you very much. The thing that really struck me is what you just said, Lisa, which is, you know, the takeaway is this tangling of compute and network, which is fundamental, uh, which I think means, and correct me, that network unavailability means compute unavailability, and compute unavailability means network unavailability. Right, so the other thing you said, this is a very multidimensional problem. So there are lots of points of attack. And I think this goes to your second recommendation, I guess, which is, should cybersecurity be something the FCC considers very seriously, particularly in the light of 5G? <laughs> Long pause. Stump the man. I'm going to take a short first cut and then I'll let you expand. But I, I would say, I, and I, th I think I'm speaking for Adam, I would say yes, this is all very intertwined, and if you have an outage, outages can be caused by security breaches as well. So I, I would say this, I would say security is tangled in with the compute communications notion as well. <laughs> I, I have a very, very simple, I'd say very, very simple answer. You know, if you look at, uh, let's say, a shutdown of the network because of a major security breach, so I can't communicate, I can't compute, I can't transact my business. I am sure the FCC will get a call and it better be prepared to answer it. Everyone's looking at you, Julie, so <laughs> just in case you hadn't noticed. Um, <laughs> you wanna give me a phone number? <laughs> Not so much reacting to that, because I didn't quite take the presentation in the same way. <laughs> uh, and what I'm scratching my head about, too, uh, first of all, terrific presentation. Uh, lots of scary thoughts and good thoughts in there at the same time. The good about all the possibilities <laughs> that are coming, the challenge, and I don't think this is necessarily you know for the FCC or government I mean there's a role but uh, for the industry too oh, yeah. uh, and, and how do you get to things like uh, we talked a little bit about the connected cars and I've been in other venues where oh the car is going to generate 45 gigabits of data over some period of time and and the question becomes yeah but how much of that you know if it were free, and folks will just transmit all of it, <laughs> and which adds to impact on the network. How do you get to the point where people understand, aside from just the money, maybe that's an element of it, where people understand uh, that there's an efficiency on what goes in. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you don't want to discourage the applications at the same time. You don't want to create loads unnecessarily. Oh, cool. yeah. yeah, and, and I, you know, I want to think more and I think, uh, and probably have a little bit more dialogue about whether this gets at the problem. One of my no. first reactions was, you know, you set up a committee, uh, I'll just, in just a second, yeah. you set up a committee and then everybody sits on the committee and say, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. <laughs> and so no. it's a little bit of struggle with that. Ju Julie, I, I think if there is an underlying text here, okay, it is that the kind of systems in the digitized world are complex systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. And unless you are at the table and have an impact, yes, somebody can come up with a solution that says, well, gee, all this communication is for free. Let's load the network 
and not get saddled with the cost of having to put computing at the edge, let's say. Okay? And the only way you can do that, deal with that is to really have completeness of input in those systems discussions. And that's, that, I would say, is a natural role for the FCC in some ways. When you say dedicated study group, who are you thinking of as the mandate? I mean, who, who's in this? I, I would say you have to have an internal champion of the FCC, <coughs> okay? But I think, as somebody said previously, uh, you do have to have industry involvement and other stakeholders, and part of the game is to really think through, and I hope we are there by, by December, so we have a much more explicit list of who ought to be involved in that kind of an exercise. Okay? I, ho I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think and, uh, more interaction as we get towards that and understanding, well, what exactly would the group do and how, uh, who would be the membership and yeah. clear goals and so forth. Uh, so you've given us, I think, a lot to think about here. <laughs> well, Jesse. Bring a microphone a little closer. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, very interesting perspective of the vision, and certainly agree with a lot of the things that you guys have talked about and learned out of your group. But you mentioned something at the end uh, in terms of recommendation, which happens to be a, a pet peeve of mine, which I tend to refer to as these lost communities. And I think you talked to them about underserved communities, whether they be rural or into the core of the urban centers. It, it, which is really driven by economics and, and the decaying infrastructure uh, in American cities as well as in rural areas as it relates to communications, computing, and the various things that you guys talked about. It wasn't clear to me in your recommendation uh, how do you address that? And some or another, everybody lumps it under this whole concept of uh, the digital divide and sort of walks away and forget about it. Yeah. I, I tend to think you need to break that out in that recommendation because it has some very unique uh, characterizations, some very unique problems, and we could go on and on. Is there a role for the FCC there or not? We can all question that, but clearly there's a role for industry and government there uh, to, to modernize those infrastructure platforms uh, because all the things that you talked about in terms of what people will be doing, uh, where my kids are in the urban communities, I've got second, with their school system, i got second and third graders that are doing some of these things where everything is done on the computer. Uh, you know, they don't bring a lot of things home, right? But I can go to some of these uh, core urban centers and there ain't no computers. So what happens to all those kids or those families or those quote unquote lost communities. I just think that what you need to do with that recommendation, lumping it all together like you did, uh, causes issues like this to be lost. And I would recommend that you sort of disaggregate that uh, such that it becomes very clear that those communities have unique challenges, whether they're rural or urban, as you call underserved, uh, because a lot of those are on DSL and we should have a lot more fiber in those communities. Well, how do you get fiber into those communities such that you can enjoy some of the computing and communications capability that you just talked about? Uh, so so I, I just don't think lumping it together is the right approach, and so I just want to give you that feedback, right? I mean, you, you're welcome to respond. It was more of a statement than it was a question. No, but I, think that's, I think that's excellent feedback, and yeah. I think we should look at that as we refine these for the final end meeting. Marvin. Uh, yeah, the um, communications is not free. Uh, it's particularly not free uh, uh, in significant quantities. And I think part of the reason we're seeing the rise of edge computing is precisely in order to reduce the cost of otherwise backhauling it to cloud data centers. And, and companies are making the trade off as long as uh, prices reflect actual resource costs. Uh, now, um, we have the, in low volumes sort of unlimited mobile service and unlimited uh, uh, fixed broadband. Um, but even there, uh, we're starting to see caps emerge. We're starting to see overage charges. So that, um, and particularly that's true for business services. Uh, so I don't think it's free, and I think that uh, 
the trends that we're uh, seeing in edge computing are precisely driven by the fact that communication isn't free. Good. Anyone on the, the web that <coughs> would like to ask a question or make a comment? Out in the ether? Hearing none, Walt, you have the last word? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to ask a different question than I intended at the beginning of this uh, <laughs> round robin. Following up on Julie's comment, uh, in 2000, approximately 2008, the commission sat down and they did a broadband study trying to look at the challenges of, of, of building a broadband infrastructure, and that study guided us for a long time. So to maybe be more direct, your proposal for a task group, is it much different than the original intent of that early broadband effort, other than your, your argument, which I agree with, is that things are changing and we need to come up with a blueprint for how we ensure a continued growth of a new type of broadband inf infrastructure in the country? As, as it relates to, uh, you're probably referring to a combination of two, recommendation two and three, Yeah, I, I think. I, I think what is somewhat different now is the level of the industrial involvement in the need for rural broadband as well, mm -hmm. and which may actually uh, mitigate some of the challenges that you might have found in 2008. Adam? No, I, I think there is, you know, in, in all of this, I think a piece of economics, and I think Marvin probably you know, hit, hit this most precisely uh, in some of the discussions. You know, if you take a look at a densely populated area, uh, I would say competition tends to drive things in the right direction. If you take a look at a sparsely populated area, <coughs> if you really want to sort of give somebody the, that full uh, set of capabilities, which would mean the computing, the storage, et cetera, et cetera, that means somebody has to be motivated to build aggregation points, uh, build the computing network that delivers value. Having it built twice doesn't help the economics. I mean, just sort of goes mm -hmm. against it, okay? So somewhere in there is, I think, buried a notion of how do you create that gray line on one side of which I think you do the logical thing that actually promotes the build out, okay? Something in between, and then an area where competition is really what does the job for you. Mm -hmm. okay. is, that, is, that was the, is that an appropriate way of articulating yeah. it? because things do cost, okay. okay? And when you start taking a look at mechanisms like the Universal Service Fund, well, having the connectivity without having the rest of the things that create value doesn't make a lot of sense. So how do you create the balance in the way those things go, okay? And, you know, is that the FCC's job or is it some other agency's job uh, to actually do that, mm -hmm. okay? So because I, I would say having an uncertainty for the providers doesn't, you know, doesn't actually lead to investment. People will hold back till they know what the rules are. And that's the value of having a plan, I would say. So, and, and just to be clear, uh, in, in developing the tasking for the work group, and so everybody yeah. understands this, it wasn't about, hey, where where might we regulate? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, no, but no. By the way, this is not about doing heavy regulation right. or anything no, like I, that. I, I, you know, we've often looked at things for the headlights, <laughs> what's yeah. coming down the road, and I don't think it's just government. I think for industry too, as, as you went through this process, the eye openers of what's coming. <laughs> And how is this all going to work so that when we get to all these new potential applications, we don't suddenly have networks that are clogged? <laughs> yep. I, I well, <laughs> you know, J Julie, it's, it's, there are simple things of, of the following sort, okay? Um, you look at, let's say, the American population, and around 10% have sleep apnea. Okay? If you buy a sleep apnea machine today, it comes with a network connection. If I'm in a certain rural area with no coverage, I don't have that connection. 
I can't get that treatment. Okay. At cost, I'm not quite sure who is responsible for the cost, but that's a problem to be solved. Yeah. Okay. And it's, an, and it's ex an example of the trends that you're seeing because there is no machine in the marketplace that doesn't have that kind of connectivity today. Now let me close things out now on this, but I give my, add my compliments too to the team and even in the way that you laid this out, it's really very, very compelling, the structure and making the case. And I think it is a huge challenge because things ain't what they used to be. <laughs> yep. It is, the world is changing. And we've been talking about the convergence for, for, for a very long time, decades, but it, the reality of it and as it is coming together now, you're underscoring, and I think we're going to see even more of that as we <coughs> transition to 5G. And I purposefully had you guys sit next to each other because yep. there are a lot of the things you've talked about that n now fit very much into yeah, the 5G we and IoT, nicely. yeah. Yep. So take it away. Oh, it isn't turned is it, on? Is it unplugged? <laughs> I think we'll just go ahead. You can just, you know, you'll be a side sideshow while we proceed forward. So, so the Russ, the Russ and Brian show. I, 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 I will share this for. Very good. This I, is a technical group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, you know, these switches. They, turning on electricity is hard. Actually, I will share an interesting side point. Uh, and I, I recruited Russ and Brian for another event that I was chairing. Uh, the Vehicular Technology Society's uh, conference here. And, and so they derived some added benefit, hopefully, out of an afternoon with some of the people around this table, too, uh, contributing to that session. But I think uh, they've been gathering a lot of data from a lot of sources, and I will, again, express my appreciation for the work that you did in that session. But being out and about is an important part of the data collection and moving forward. So, so you turned it. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, uh, don't soon, be six take of note there. of the man behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, please count the number of people involved. This is the answer to a time-honored joke. Yeah, Marty, for your wireless power transmission group. <laughs> okay. Can 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 <laughs> there, there are uh, slides. I think we have what eight minutes now. Right. 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 Why don't you try switching it into Very into good. another Very power strip? Building on the height. Here's our. Thank my co-chair, Brian and I have been doing this together and it's working fairly well, very well. And we have great FCCA liaisons as well as on our next team, a esteemed panel of um, team members. Uh, apologies to Steve Landing, your name got dropped in the formatting, so apologies for that. So just to go over real quickly what our mission is in this group, um, you know, it's to study and report on the state of development of 5G in well, we call it uh, 5G era IoT applications across various market sectors and the network impact evolution. And one of the goals, or the key goal is, are there things the commission or other government agencies can or should do? I think we need to change that also to or shouldn't do relative to 5G and IoT to facilitate such developments. So what we're gonna talk about today is we've done a bit of the framing. We don't have what I would call, um, you know, really firm recommendations, we're starting to confirm or gel on some recommendation areas, and we'd like some input from both the TAC members as well as the FCC staff on those. Um, so over the summer break, um, which really isn't a break, but <laughs> <laughs> we're not in school anymore, unfortunately, but um, we did have a number of invited speakers that we brought in, um, ITU, um, R, we went into a deep dive on what Working Party 5D is doing relative with 5G, 
5G Americas gave us their point of view. We talked to some AR, VR experts from Ericsson looking at what type of application would really drive use cases requiring such low latency and massive compute. If you recall at the last face-to-face -face meeting we talked about, there was not a single, single killer app that we could come up with that was like dependent on 5G. And we'll, that, that's going to be important later in this discussion too. Um, 5G ACIA um, is a group that was established that's looking at a number of um, use cases and verticals to drive 5G into, such as manufacturing. They're trying to get to a point of even doing um, what's called TSN or time sensitive networking, which is an Ethernet type capability um, to be able to sim stimulate or simulate that with 5G. Um, also, 5G Automotive Association, which was a, a good viewpoint, as well as Brian and I, as Dennis mentioned, were part of the VTC event that Dennis hosted up in Chicago about a month ago. We have not talked to CTI yet. They're on our radar. Somehow they slipped through and got on the slide. <laughs> so it's a little preliminary. We also talked to some researchers on some opportunities related to smart roaming. Um, you know, it's a very interesting concept we need to look at. Um, we investigated and had some great discussions amongst the team members, and we'll be doing some deeper dives on 5G relative to the digital divide. Both Adam and Lisa brought this up somewhat. Um, we're, we're focusing on the 5G aspects of that. Um, also investigating barriers and roadblocks to deployment, explore tech, uh, spectrum policy, and then last that slipped off the slide um, is mobile edge compute and slicing. Um, both Adam and Lisa talked a little bit about the distributed compute. We're going to talk about mobile edge compute specific to 5G. Okay, so just taking a look at the landscape here, uh, or the framing discussion. So in the framing we're going to talk about today, we're going to cover standards some of the deployments that are out there, um, potential barriers to deployment. Um, this relates to sort of the goal of the group in terms of what the FCC should do or shouldn't do. Um, we'll go over what LTE is in the evolution, and we'll talk about IoT a little bit. We'll get a, a little bit of information on slicing and edge computing, but we're going to take a really deep dive on both mobile edge compute and slicing in the next quarter. Um, as I mentioned, policy and spectrum management um, topics, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, the digital divide. We've got some, some good basis for discussions there, and we think that's a good area for us to dive into moving forward in terms of a recommendation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and then he'll go through some of the standards work that's been done, some of the framing work there, and turn it back over to me, and I'll probably talk about some of the mobile edge compute. Okay, thanks, Russ. Um, well, well, first off, I think it's important to frame uh, the discussion on what 5G is, because if you put five people in a room, you'll get five definitions on what 5G is, at least five definitions. Um, it's not millimeter wave, it, it's not slicing, it, it's all of the above. It, it, it encompasses a full specification, system specification, uh, everything from the radio, new radio, core network, LTE evolution uh, is, is even part of the 5G definition per 3GPP. So, so really, it, it's good to frame in and, and discuss what is 5G uh, from, from the perspective, especially of the standards. Uh, most recently, 3GPP release 15 uh, has been, and I'll use this in air quotes, completed, um, meaning that you know, the first round of 5G specifications are, are available. Um, now, the figure on this chart shows that there really are a number of dimensions when we look at 5G. Um, if, if you recall, we talked last time about the ITU defining really three, three uh, legs of the pyramid uh, of 5G use cases, the enhanced mobile broadband, uh, the ultra-reliable low-latency use cases, and, and the massive IoT. <coughs> Um, 3GPP added the fourth uh, on network operations uh, because you actually have to operate uh, these networks and you, and you need network management and orchestration, charging, billing, and all that stuff to, to go along with it. Um, when we look at 3GPP release 15, uh, the real focus is on just one leg of this. It's on the enhanced mobile broadband case. So things like the real low latency stuff that, that Adam uh, and their group talked about and, and, and what we'll be talking about really is going to be coming in as part of release 16, as well as the massive IoT. That, that's really going to be part of, you know, of release 16 in order to, to fulfill uh, those requirements. Um, so I mentioned 
three GPP is more than new radio, more than millimeter wave, more than this and that. Um, when you look at three GPP, every specification from release 15 onwards is going to have that 5G logo. So that includes not only the new radio and the 5G next generation core, uh, but also the LTE evolution and evolution to the packet core network that supports LTE. Um, so, so that's going to get the uh, everything that's done in release 15 for those technologies will have the 5G logo as well on those specifications. Um, we're going to talk a minute about standalone and non-standalone um, uh, support uh, and, and, and what's in uh, release 15. Um, really, there's three standards drops when you look at release 15. The first drop was back in December of last year, uh, which had the priority on the non-standalone option uh, to get the uh, chipset vendors to start developing chipsets for those early deployments. Uh, this past June, uh, there was the completion of the, the standalone option two, and then we'll look at uh, the third drop coming in December of this year with the priority on uh, non-standalone options four and seven. And I've got some pictures if, if those don't ring a bell. Um, 3GPP release 16 has already started, uh, and, and the important thing about release 16 is this is going to be what forms the IMT 2020 submission. Um, if, if you uh, followed 5G at all, uh, the ITU started this process back in around 2012 or so, uh, where they had their initial vision of, of, of IMT 2020. Uh, they came out with a set of performance uh, requirements uh, around you know, a couple of years back that, that really defined what those performance characteristics are to meet uh, an IMT 2020 technology. 3GPP release 16 uh, has the goal to support the submission into uh, the ITU IMT 2020 process, and, and those release 16 standards will be those that will go in, into that process. And as I mentioned, they'll also support the other uh, dimensions of the use cases that are, that are defined uh, on that chart, uh, as well as you know, further support for things like network, network slicing. So this uh, slide shows really those timelines that I just went over verbally uh, and shows them more pictorially. So right now, release 15 is, is complete, uh, meaning that the majority of, of the work uh, leading toward uh, both options uh, three and option two, the, the non-standalone and standalone options have been complete. Uh, there's a late drop coming later this year that'll support uh, options four and seven, the additional options that, that will go in to make up the release. Uh, 3GPP release 16 has been in progress. Uh, the requirements and, and initial studies have been ongoing for those, and that was targeted for the end of next year completion. And as I mentioned, that aligns with the ITU process where, where that needs to go into the ITU in order to meet the uh, IMT 2020 submission and evaluation process and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, end up being an IMT 2020 uh, specification. This uh, picture tries to put it all together to show what a 3GPP release 15 system is. And, and I mentioned a number of options, both non-standalone and standalone. Um, what non-standalone means is you build upon the LTE network that you have deployed and you put the 5G new radio uh, into that network in, able, in order to support the enhanced mobile broadband applications. So you'll see option three non-standalone uh, in the center of the figure. Uh, that shows uh, control signaling going through the LTE side uh, with the 5G new radio supporting the uh, user plane side, uh, and that um, you know connects up to the uh, LTE E node Bs uh, and the uh, existing packet core network. So, in some of the announcements you've seen, deployments you know starting as early as the end of this year, um, those typically are what you'll see at, at some of those uh, early deployments. Um, there also is the standalone option uh, that was just completed in June of this year. That's where you remove the LTE altogether. You have the 5G new radio connected to the 5G uh, next generation uh, E node B, or, or G node B as it's called, as well as the 5G next generation core network. Um, the options four and seven non-standalone, I'll show you on the next figure, uh, those also uh, being non-standalone require the LTE network to be in place, but there's different evolutionary paths in order to get you 
uh, from um, your, your LTE 5G new radio deployments uh, in, into a, a 5G non-standalone scenario. And also shown on here is your LTE enhancements. Remember I said that 5G specifications release 15 onward uh, also will include LTE enhancements. So LTE will continue to evolve um, with, with promises of speeds up to, you know, in, in the gigabit range, uh, as well as additional low latency enhancements going into LTE as well. Um, this shows possible evolution paths uh, operators can look at uh, to get from uh, their LTE networks today uh, to uh, 5G new radio deployments and eventually evolve to a full option to standalone uh, 5G system. Um, th this, you know, this, this shows two paths where you go from option three to option four to option two or option three to option seven to option four to two. Um, it's, it's not meant to be comprehensive. I mean, operators, you know, have different ways to get there, uh, may choose paths that may not be fully reflected on here. Uh, but this just shows that the standards are, are being designed so that it gives flexibility for operators to leverage their LTE networks that they have in place today, uh, deploy 5G new radio, uh, whether it be in millimeter wave or not, uh, as well as, uh, you know, getting to the full option two standalone. So where are we today with deployment? Uh, there's a lot of proof of concepts and trials well underway. Uh, I think everybody's probably seen the press reports of those both here in the U.S. and worldwide. Uh, there's also been deployment announcements, uh, especially in the past month or so with the Mobile World uh, Congress Americas uh, just recently completed. Uh, so, for example, AT&T uh, is launching 5G across 19 cities uh, through next year. Uh, Sprint it'll, uh, says it'll bring five, first 5G smartphones to the U.S. next year. Uh, T-Mobile uh, bolsters its 5G ambitions with uh, a supplier deal with Ericsson, and Verizon uh, will launch its 5G home internet service starting October 1st. So the reality of 5G is it's close. Uh, we're going to see it, you know, starting the uh, end of this year, uh, and and next year we'll bring even more. <coughs> Sure. <coughs> so I think there's really, um, when you take a look at the requirements for 5G, there are several, you know, re realities here in terms of what it requires to be deployed. So there's densification, which means the number of cell sites that are required are new cell sites. And this is going to depend as well on spectrum. The higher the spectrum, the more cell sites. But with that densification, um, there's also a lot of permitting that's, been, that's required. Um, time for approvals, negotiation of fees, um, you know, the deployment, and then there's the backhaul or the cross haul, X haul is what we call it because there's backhaul and front haul requirements for both old cell sites and new cell sites if you're going to upgrade to 5G to capable services. Um, the last one is really, you know, building owners or um, cell site areas not fully understanding what's required in terms of power permitting, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we're still diving into this topic and it's an area for potential recommendation on a cross industry group because we don't see this as just like, yeah, give, give carte blanche approval to whatever, you know, a carrier wants to put in place. It has to be balanced with what fits within that, that area. But the bottom line is how do we make this more streamlined? How do we make this uh, a quicker process? Um, there's been a number of articles um, referenced on this slide, slide is a Wall Street Journal article about um, you know, 5G running into local resistance. It's one of those things where everybody wants it, but it's kind of like not in my backyard um, sort of mentality at the same time. Pardon? Um, yeah, I can either way. Um, yeah, so as Brian mentioned um, on, you know, LTE is not going away. LTE will be, um, enhancements will be um, completed with 5G moving forward. In fact, you'll start to see the 5G logo used um, in combination with LTE being um, enhanced as well as the 5G deployments and release 15, rele or release 15 is done, but as release 16 comes out. Um, I think one of the key takeaways when you look at this slide is, you know, there's this 10-year densification roadmap. You know, everybody, there's a lot of hype out in the press of 5G and 
there's this race and all these announcements and everything, but in reality, we have to be realistic of this will take time as well. I mean, 5G will take a long time to get built out into the, the networks and, and to become, you know, ubiquitous across the nation. So, and we'll talk about the digital divide in a little bit, but just to keep in mind here, um, you know, there's a lot of 5G use cases that are capable of being supported on LTE today, which also will lend itself to the discussion on the digital divide we'll have in a little bit. Um, just from the perspective of network slicing, um, it's a very interesting concept. As Brian pointed out, this will not come out as well until the end of release 16, in, but you know, people are still dividing or um, designing services around this. Um, we've had a, a, we'll be producing a white paper at the end of the year for the FCC on what that actually means. The nice thing about slicing is it's, in a way, it provides multi-tenancy on a shared network that is completely separate and private and can have its own QoS, can have its own um, management. I, I think some of the, the interesting things that are coming out, again, this was proposed but was never realized in 4G. It was part of LTE. Um, but it does enable the network elements and functions to be easily configured and reused. Uh, also, it's um, an end-to-end -end feature that includes the core and the RAN. So it's not just a localized um, slice. Each slice can have its own network architecture, engineering, and network provisioning, another great capability. Um, a network slice compri comprises dedicated and or shared resources. Um, and slicing is also dynamic in nature. It's viewed that it should be dynamic, so you can increase a slice based on what its capabilities are. Um, there's interesting possibilities for different services, including emergency services in that regard. Um, and also IoT support, you have this various, if you take a look at the diagram on the right, you have the option to support different QoS, different latency, um, broadband um, capabilities, et cetera. So what, you know, the question always comes up, how many slices will there be? You know, it's not like a pizza, you know. I remember I called one pizza place and I said, how, what size pizza do you have? And he goes, well, how many slices would you like? And I said, <laughs> I, I said, well, you know, slice it into 24, I'm really hungry. But, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I think the reality you have to look at here is, um, I, that still just comes back to me every time I call pizza place. Um, but, you know, it, it's a factor of both business and technical needs, operational needs. So there's, there's really, you know, providers may use slicing from an operational basis or providers may use it, or are going to definitely use it to provide different business services and different offerings. So some interesting opportunities coming up on slicing. We're gonna do a much deeper dive on this and produce a report coming up next. Um, okay, so talking about edge computing, um, and this really, you know, when it started off, it was about, you know, the premise was to place generic compute, but really it's beyond generic compute when it comes to 5G. Mobile edge computing is literally tied into the architecture of 5G and the diagram on the right shows this where you have the 3GPP architecture with mobile edge compute tied into it and the reason is you have much greater orchestration in terms of how that is is working together. Um, realistically what you're going to see are new radio deployments then the packet core and then ultimately mobile edge compute. So we may not see real mobile edge compute evolving for some time as we move forward. Um, it is extending the cloud more locally, you know, even though 5G promises great, you know, bandwidth and super low latency, mobile edge compute just enhances that by giving you even more power at the edge. Um, you know, in terms of some of the ultra high reliability and critical applications, we've looked at everything from automated driving, traffic control, V to X, um, of course, VR and AR applications, mission critical uses, public safety, remote healthcare, Remote surgery is one I'm not totally comfortable with. I think the rest of you should try it first. Um, I think when we look at other things, real extreme real-time applications that are still yet to be evolved, um, real-time HD video sharing, industrial manufacturing applications, um, and robotic controls, these are real things. Robotics are really taking over a lot of the industrial applications and um, functions. And so it'll be interesting, groups like 5G, ACIA are driving this, like as I mentioned earlier, with things like TSN um, capabilities. But um, again, the, the really interesting part of this is 
the evolution from what was, I would say, 3G, 4G, LTE to 5G that's going to have really integrated mobile edge compute. Okay, next slide is the digital divide. And we've got two slides on this in a lot of words. Um, the net net is 5G could possibly make the digital divide worse, at least in the short term. And the reason for that is, um, you know, 5G is being deployed, obviously, in urban areas first. Um, it's really based on a business case. Um, there's a lot of investment. I mentioned some of the, you know, the three criteria in terms of densification, permitting, and uh, backhaul. And these are all things that rural does not compete well with urban areas. Um, so millimeter wave bands will have early benefit in urban suburban areas. Um, you know, just by the way, back to that point, it's probably r expected that we'll see 100 megabit versus gigabit speeds in some of the urban areas compared to rural areas. So um, we're diving into this and looking at what could be key driving points. Um, I want to thank Marty for his participation and leadership, by the way, on the team in pushing this topic. And um, he's got some really good ideas, and we're, we're addressing those on the group as well. Um, I think rural communities are going to benefit after transport transport infrastructure is established with the mid-band. Um, again, these deployments are likely to be capital intensive. We're looking at use cases um, that could help drive this, of course. Combination of low and high frequency bands are crucial for coverage and capability. Wider bandwidths, bandwidths than 4G anticipated at mid-band and millimeter wave. Also, lower bands, um, sub-6 gigahertz for coverage and millimeter wave developed in parallel. Carriers are not choosing one over the other. Um, the differences in timing and how carriers manage spectrum in the sub-6 gigahertz bands. So the second slide on this, um, we dive a little bit into, you know, the realities here. So for communities that are 4K to 20K populations, you know, it probably requires some um, either upgrading or being able to leverage the existing fiber infrastructure that's in place. For the less dense rural areas, um, these are the 1K to 4K population communities, um, it's either going to require new or complete existing fiber infrastructure for backhaul. And remember, backhaul is a big deal. Things aren't wireless for very long in 5G. They have to hit a backhaul um, at some point. So, you know, again, this becomes the smaller the area, the less dense the area in terms of population, the more difficult the challenge is. Um, there's many f uh, cases for fixed wireless access um, architecture. Um, that you know we feel it can cost effectively reach homes and businesses where fiber cannot um, basically this is saying the virtual fiber to the home connection via 5g wireless also rural areas outside of town require use of lower bands for coverage to facilitate iot services um, the investment opportunities we're looking at for is anchor tenants possibly are things like healthcare, agriculture um, which is today called precision agriculture education and connected highways We've also had discussions, by the way, with people like John Deere um, Corporation looking at what their requirements are in terms of um, remote driving of tractors, things like that. Um, I think the way one of them put it, you see all those straight lines in the field when you fly over them? That's not just because the farmer's really good at driving straight. <laughs> There's a lot of help and assist going on there. Um, so taking a look at next steps um, <clears throat> towards the December finish, what we're, we're focused on is a white paper on network slicing, white paper on mobile edge compute, um, recommendations related to 5G impact on digital divide. <coughs> and again, we'd, we're looking for input from the TAC as well as the FCC. Uh, recommendation on a multi-stakeholder group. We had talked about this balance of new radio placement with community um, desires and needs. And then a potential recommendation on a public notice related to experimental use of spectrum um, yeah, this is related to sort of uh, the topic of smart roaming where we had a, a, one of the professors came in and talked about. So the question gets to, is there enough experimental spectrum for researchers to look at different areas to either optimize or um, to um, come up with new services or capabilities? So I think that concludes it um, for Brian and I. So we thank you and thank the team for their, their input. And I'm sure there's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck on that. Darn. I, I, I think you can all see why having these two presentations back to back were appropriate because there is a 
a great deal of, of connectivity uh, between and them. We appreciate, um, we've actually done some shared um, meetings together, right. for instance, on ARVR, and um, Adam regularly participates, which is great. So, right. you know, we'll probably carve off certain pieces of um, that moving forward, and we'll collaborate more on mobile edge compute, Good. too. Yeah, and joint actionable recommendations are perfectly acceptable as you go to the next full round. Michael, you're the first one up with your card. <laughs> hey, thanks, Brian and Russ. Um, do you expect to see other uh, submissions uh, besides the 3 pp submission into WIC19 as IMT2020 candidate? And the reason I ask is that the, the presentation, which is great, by the way, seems to be very uh, 3HPP centric. Mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of depicts the picture of a you know, 5G bandwagon, however we define it. It's kind of pulled by more of license spectrum with a 3HPP technology. How does L, you know, unlicensed, other you know, competing technology kind of fit into this uh, grand scheme of 5G? Yeah, good question, and, and, and the answer is yes, uh, there will be other submissions. <laughs> <laughs> um, one notable um, is, is the IEEE and, and the evolution of, of 802 technologies. And, and uh, early on uh, in the 5G discussions, the IEEE and 3GPP actually talked about you know, possibly a joint work, joint submissions, uh, but that kind of fizzled out. Um, so I know IEEE is heavily engaged in, in, in 5G work as well. Um, I don't have first-hand knowledge, but I would anticipate that they, they would do a submission as well. So I'm, I'm assuming you guys have some plans to maybe bring them in on subsequent tech working group meetings, maybe get some uh, of their viewpoints as well. That's an action for us, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm actually putting in our, our parking lot of Items to follow up on. Yeah, yeah. I, I e has held another a number of uh, symposiums and do have a 5G program um, that that's pretty active. So I I've got some contacts in there and we'll we'll pull them in. Do you have any other recommendations though besides I e uh, No, I just wasn't sure. I mean, before when there was a competition between you know I e 3PP, 3PP2, but I yeah. think after some consolidation. Uh, I, I, I I don't so know. So let me add. That's something. I think IEEE just renamed that whole program Future Communications. Yeah. Okay, so not to have a conflict with 3GP. Yeah, that's what I was just going to Yeah. As really the place where the standards are being set. Yeah. yeah. So I, it will be great to get an overview of other competing technologies that will be competed sure. in that, that yeah. you know, WIC19, IMT2020 beauty contest and give us some sort of a feedback. I think it will be very helpful. Yeah, if you, if you looked at, you know, like IMT 2020, you know, or, or uh, <laughs> IMT 2000, you, there was more of a, a yeah. beauty contest there, more candidate submissions. I think there's more convergence at this point. Um, I, sure. And I wouldn't call it a competition. It's only 20 years ago. So. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a competition either. As, as Adam mentioned, it's more complementary, um, looking at what IEEE is doing versus 3GPP. Okay, Greg. Uh, Brian, Russ. Uh, I, I really appreciate the way you, you've divided out all the issues. But let me get to the digital divide issue, because I'm wondering if it's not quite as big a divide as we think. At least in the 4G world, um, in a rural setting, there are fewer people to use the bandwidth that's available. And the, the big issue for 4G in, in a city is that uh, you, you run out of bandwidth because there's too many people trying to access it at once. Um, as you go to 5G, and assuming that you're going to go to many microcells in a city, which you can't do rurally, even though you're going to be dividing that bandwidth between a large number of people, um, it's not going to be the bandwidth that you're supplying. Each person won't be getting the bandwidth that uh, you're supplying because there is such a densification of people. So. Does that mean that the digital divide is not quite as big a divide as we're making it? I, I see where you're going with that. And, and yeah, I think to some aspects you're right. Uh, because when you look at the deployment of dense microwave cells, or millimeter wave cells in, in the urban areas, you're really focusing in on, on the bandwidth and, and the number of people and, and making sure you can support them. 
Um, when you get to the rural areas, looking at more coverage uh, aspects, you know, getting the new radio into the low bands, yeah, you're, you're not splitting that bandwidth up as many ways. So, so in some aspects, yeah, we, we probably should take a look at that. Yeah, I, I think your argument is basically people per gigabit, but you're assuming that you have the same 5G deployments both in rural areas as you have in urban areas, which is probably not a, a good assumption to make. Well, I'm trying initially. not to make that assumption because I know you're not going to be able to put micro cells on the farm. So um, if you, you go to mid-band and you have one cell that covers a bigger area, there just aren't as many people in that area that are going to use it up. Yeah, it's just a, I think we still get to the challenge of what are the economics for deployment mm -hmm. to, to get to that point even because you, you still have, you know, somebody's got to pay for it, right? And so the, there's a certain <coughs> CapEx as well as OpEx with putting out a network regardless whether it's enhanced LTE yeah. or 5G. So the fewer people, the fewer people to pay for it. And you have, you know, it's, it's much more expensive. I think, you know, from a service provider perspective, I'm sure they would tell you a lot of the cost is in the distance of putting the backhaul in or putting the site in, whatever. But I mean, we'll definitely dive into this topic. I think it's an interesting area to pursue. And, and I think when you have use cases, I think as Adam mentioned, as I drive out of the city and my car doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so our connected, you know, is connected transportation, at least on the major highways, a good like anchor tenant to start the 5G deployments. Thanks. There is latency in this whole issue as well. Yep. Marty. Well, I want to continue that uh, discussion if you give me a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, this group does a superb job at uh, anticipating and planning uh, what the next generation of technologies is, uh, is going to be. Uh, we don't do so well at the timing part. And uh, it turns out uh, uh, they, are, they are connected. And I just want to, uh, I hope I don't, uh, uh, present a half-baked thought. Uh, w let's talk about this timing for a minute because uh, uh, we got a comment <laughs> here that uh, 5G is here, here, millimeter wave is here. And that's true. Uh, there have been studies done on how long it takes from the first implementation of a new significant technology. And I would suggest that 5G is a significant technology to when your neighbor has one. Uh, anybody want to know, uh, make a guess at what the typical time is? Anybody? Five years. 20 years. Yeah. Well, the, if it's that new, yeah. From the time, uh, the, the first example they gave was a microwave oven. And from the time the first microwave ovens were introduced, which cost uh, uh, $11,000 a piece, uh, to the time when they were widely deployed, and it, what it turns out was something like 19 years. Yeah. And if you look at almost every technology, it really takes that long. We, we, our minds don't accept that. Now, when you start putting time frames like that on things like uh, uh, the thing that uh, Jesse brought up, serving rural areas, serving the areas in the middle of the city, uh, look what's going to happen when you have all of that huge deployment of data that's got to happen, and, and that's the first thing, the amount of data. The second thing is the social implication of that data, because all of a sudden, some of those data uh, elements are essential. You, you do not do education for only the people that can uh, access millimeter wave. Well, we have uh, rules in this country that say that everybody's entitled to an education, and what happens when you need so many gigabytes of, of uh, or gigahertz or whatever for every student every year? It turns out that the numbers, even in the rural areas, are going to become huge. So when you put those three things together, the time, the social implication, uh, and the uh, uh, amount of data, you certainly find out that even in the rural areas, there's a huge market. And, and so Adam's point about uh, uh, if, this is, if there's a big market, competition is going to solve that problem for us. 
So I, um, uh, I don't have any solutions, but I'm just observing that if we start adding in the time element, we may see a more clear path to solving these problems. Otherwise, we're never going to uh, solve the rural or, or the inner uh, city issues. Great. Well, since the tent cards are down and since our time is, I guess, no, no, they're, so they both have their tent cards still up and that's good. That's a signal that you want to speak and since you're up, you can now speak. <laughs> oh, and thank you. <laughs> Yeah, pay no attention to the <laughs> men crawling on the floor. The yeah. I, w I will note, by the way, Michael's bringing you this new technology in less than a 20 year cycle. It's so. <laughs> <laughs> not done yet. <laughs> so, is this, Walter, is this in, in, in Michael's uh, uh, design? Think about this. <laughs> no, much appreciated. All right. I, the Marty and Greg show is on. Thank you. Uh, let's. Our, our group has. Give me a second to pull up my slide. We'll face the mic. Our our group has continued to have. Turn turn the mic towards your. Put it in, in your mouth. Speak into the mic. Oh, we're. Okay, we'll just keep switching back and forth. Um, the, we've continued to have a very interesting array of speakers every week to, to tell us about different aspects of antenna technology. Um, Do you have a clicker? Brian, can I have the clicker? Yeah, put the slides up, please. And uh, let me take this this time to just thank all those speakers. We'll be listing them as we go through the presentation, but the amount of time that people have dedicated to us, to our education, is a phenomenal. Uh, this is our group, uh, pretty much the same as the last time you saw it. Uh, we get a very good turnout every week, too. It's a, a very interesting group. We get uh, all kinds of good questions during a presentation, and it's, I think it's been very educational for all of us. So antenna technology, um, as, as we've said, the, we're tasked with, develop, with determining the state of the development of antenna technologies and their implications for FCC policies, um, also for technical standards, regulatory, and technical issues. Uh, we were told, and as we keep talking, we, we are drifting toward 5G, I suppose, like uh, many people are, but we try to keep an eye on the fact that there are other services out there and they are also benefiting from antenna technology advancements. Um, we've heard from people who have told us about their multi-element arrays that can dynamically focus signals and thus in, uh, avoid interference by pointing the signal to where you want it to go and not pointing the signal to where other people are. Um, we aren't sure yet and uh, by the time we present our recommendations, we will know if this is going to require new technical standards and rules. Uh, we, we learned something about metamaterials, very exciting uh, and we, we, I, got, I especially got very excited about it. Uh, to the point that I'm trying to build one, but <laughs> but um, we we then went looking for uh, examples of metamaterials being used in antennas in industry and weren't able to find too many. Uh, we talked a little about this. Uh, one of the issues is that metamaterials make very good narrowband antennas, but uh, a lot of the antennas today re are requiring wideband coverage. So that is one reason why you're not seeing so many of them out there, but we have heard from the experts that they're working on it. So we hope to see it soon. Also, uh, we've talked to people who've told us about massive MIMO, multi-user MIMO, 
uh, spatial division, multiple access, and other technologies that all promise to increase our spectral efficiency. Can we reuse the same frequency in a smaller space by more closely directing our antennas, our antenna beams? Uh, today's higher frequencies um, also because, again, as we go toward 5G and people are talking about getting up in the tens and even some people are talking about hundreds of gigahertz, um, just the, f the physics allows for smaller sizes. Uh, the, the wavelengths are smaller, so the antenna elements can be smaller, and thus you can put more of them in a space. And if you can have more of them, then your MIMO and your, your dynamic uh, focusing can all be based on more elements and can be more exact. Uh, there are trade-offs, of course, and um, one of the trade-offs is that they're, they're expensive at this point. Um, and as one of our, our group members brought up, uh, some of these designs have already been explored in other settings, particularly the military. So as we get to manufacturing these things at scale, though the prices will come down and they will be more affordable. Um, one of the things we realized too is there are so many new frequency bands that our antenna designers now have to design antennas that can work at all those different bands. It's not just one antenna per frequency anymore. Uh, we were also introduced to an issue that I've, ever since I heard about this, I've been seeing it everywhere. Um, that uh, especially in small cells, antennas aren't exactly the most beautiful th things. And even if you like the way they look, some of the installations aren't that beautiful either. So if it's possible to disguise antennas, it will certainly help to facilitate acceptance of the dense deployments that small cells will require, because people won't, just won't realize that they're there. And municipalities, uh, and the access to their poles and their street lights uh, is presenting special challenges, uh, both on wooden poles and even in metal poles that are being put up in the middle of a city. So uh, the topics we're investigating are antenna and propagation modeling tools. Well, we haven't spent much time on, time on those, but we plan to in the next month. <coughs> Uh, Near-field interactions, because as uh, different antenna systems get put up, not everybody is going to be accessing them in the far field. Um, the use of antennas in an interference rejection and also filtering antennas. How, how can your antenna be used to get rid of the signals you don't want to hear? Uh, we Certainly, we'll be uh, providing some recommendations. We have some uh, sample recommendations at the end of this talk, but please don't think that those are going to be the, the ones. Uh, but we'll show you where, our, where we're thinking. And then in a couple months, we'll have the final set of recommendations. We're also looking at white papers, certainly at least one white paper, uh, as time draws to a close, that. Uh, original list of four, uh, a little more than I think we'll be able to handle. But certainly one that will capture what we've learned about the current state of antenna technology over this year. And I'm not keeping up, so that's, okay, so now you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, <laughs> I thought I was the only one to have that. Ap apologize for that. No, that, it's a disease that affects many of us, I think. The, the guys before us were so good, I, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we talked to three different people about metamaterials. Uh, the first w actually is coming out with a product using common LCDs, the same that go into these TVs that we're looking at. Actually, we're not looking at them, but uh, what most of you are looking at. 
um, using that material to generate a directional antenna, a, a focusable antenna that they, they're going to use for satellite communication. Uh, then we talked to a, an academic, a professor of metamaterials for many years, who told us about all the possible things that could be done with them. That's what got me excited. It actually got all of us excited, but then um, we realized that there's still more to be done with that. And then f uh, the third metamaterial uh, person, uh, Eric Black, told us about uh, terrestrial use of uh, switchable metamaterials, similar to what uh, the satellite metamaterial guy was doing, but he's doing it on, uh, for antennas that are used terrestrially. Uh, we, we then talked about smart antennas, and I'd like to give this over to Marty because Marty uh, is, espouses uh, smart antennas in a way I've never heard before. He, after you've heard, it, heard him talk about them, you're going to want a smart antenna. So I, I'm going to put the mic over in front of him <laughs> and, and let, let him tell us about no, no, Everybody's heard my story on the smart antennas. Yeah, I'm not sure everyone what, has. What, uh, what I really wanted to do was to summarize uh, uh, what we've done, and uh, uh, my views may not en entirely coincide with uh, Greg's, yeah, but uh, uh, we really have uh, had a, a lot of speakers and done a lot of research outside of our meetings, and we've ended up with uh, disappointments, surprises, validations, uh, and digressions. The disappointments were we did look at fractal antennas and that uh, turns out uh, uh, there's really not much there. People have been talking about them for years, and we'd like to think that you could take a, a, a piece of wire and bend it in a certain way and get a whole bunch of things. And we finally found a speaker who really understood this thing and pointed out, yeah, you can get multiple uh, resonances, but we really don't know how to control that very well. And so there are a lot of, uh, of people doing this thing uh, on, uh, an individual basis and single antennas. Uh, metal materials, well, you, you know, I just told you my rule, of 20 year rule about, uh, it turns out there's a 20 year rule on technology. From the, <laughs> from the first time somebody de uh, demonstrates a new technology in the laboratory to when you have the first practical right. implementation, the history is that's pretty much 20 years. And, and that's where we are with metal materials. There are so many different things that you call metamaterials, and nobody yet can really define those things clearly. And they put some stuff together and they get a phenomenon and uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but there has not been a single real application of what you'd call a metamaterial where somebody is sci has science behind it and can explain why it happened. So we're still in the, in the laboratory uh, position. Some of those things, as Greg points out, are really exciting, they've got a material and where you can apply a voltage and change the material from a perfect reflector at one end to a perfect absorber at the other end. Boy, you know, it's really exciting. Only one problem, it's, a, it's at only one frequency. So, you know, uh, you, you'd like to think you could make an invisible something, but only invisible to a signal. So anyway, uh, th those were the disappointments because we really would have liked to have seen that. Big surprise, at least to me, uh, had to do with uh, millimeter waves. Uh, you know, we have uh, some 40, 45 years of experience in the uh, gigahertz to three to four gigahertz uh, frequencies for mobile use. And we have learned a great deal in those things. As some people here still remember when we described uh, the cellular environment as a bunch of uh, hexagons and, uh, you know, Right now, we are doing things dynamically, adaptively, and uh, uh, nothing looks like uh, axions anymore. <laughs> well, it turns out that uh, there are some differences between the uh, millimeter waves and the lower frequencies, and they don't necessarily have to do with uh, Maxwell's laws. They have to do with the environment, that the environment for the millimeter waves, because you're talking much shorter ranges, is very different than the Lorian. So we are still in the very learning stages, and I don't think that uh, 
uh, that uh, Brian would uh, argue with that, that that's one of the reasons that uh, AT and AT and Verizon are doing these things. But it's going to be uh, quite a while before the millimeter wave frequencies what we know as much as we do that. The uh, validation part uh, turned out to be just what Greg was talking about. Uh, uh, I was talking about SDMA, and you guys have all heard that before. And the issue is not uh, uh, putting out beams. It's literally taking energy from a base station and putting it right at the antenna that you want to send it to, and as Greg pointed out, not putting it in other places. And it turns out that there are people offering products now uh, with uh, uh, field experience, and they can do that, and they can do that at far lower cost than deploying new uh, cell sites and, and new base stations. So I think that that's a technology whose time has arrived, and we're going to see some uh, results of that very shortly. And the uh, final area was digressions, uh, and that has to do with uh, aesthetics. And uh, my conclusion was that uh, that's not the job of the FCC. And, uh, and, and what led me to that conclusion was uh, at one of our meetings, I had to take uh, sitting outside of a restaurant, and I started looking at the environment, and I could see about 40 or 50 poles with nothing but electrical attachment to them. And I cannot describe to you how ugly <laughs> all those <laughs> attachments are. And for, for to suggest that the FCC uh, has the role of cleaning up the aesthetics of the world is, uh, uh, but, uh, but the but the Chief FCC does ha have a role. Any <laughs> candidates? <laughs> the FCC does have a role, and that is somehow to make sure that the local communities uh, understand the value of having uh, this uh, these new technologies available in their towns. Uh, and uh, uh, get them to understand it enough so that they welcome these things instead of making it hard. And the worst example of that is New York, who have uh, set up a standard uh, where they, uh, they've got an antenna container and a cell site electronic container, neither of which is big enough to hold anything practical. <laughs> so you can't do 5G in New York with any frequencies. <laughs> So uh, those are my, my comments. Please go ahead, Greg. Oh, no, that, <coughs> that was helpful. And, and I think you've kind of gone through all of your charts, too, uh, Greg. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine, because um, actually anything Marty says, I, I love to hear. But uh, what, what he told us about smart antennas, and he thinks you've all heard it, I don't mm -hmm. think you all have, because he, he really proselytizes for smart antennas. And I, I was sold. I think once, and, and when I understood what's the difference between a steered antenna and a smart antenna, I, I really appreciated how important smart is in the sense that a smart antenna re gets feedback from all around and determines what are the other factors, not just what direction are you pointing the main beam, but what's, hap what's it bouncing off of? What's it being attenuated by? And you make adjustments so that all those things come together to put the signal in the place you want it to be. And that, to me, that's the difference between a smart antenna and just a steerable antenna. Steerable is a wonderful thing. And, and from my background, I, I appreciate steerable. But smart really goes the extra step. And we heard from. Uh, Antonio Ferenza at Artemis, who they had a different concept. They're, in their case, they did smart antennas by taking an input from all over town. They had cell sites all over town, saw what the cell site was hearing from the one that was transmitting, all of them, and they all uh, returned that information back to the main cell site and said, and then that cell site said, well, this is where my signal's going, let me adjust. And the, that adjustment occurs to get a, what he told us was a very exact personal cell. Um, uh, one of the things about smart antennas, uh, and Marty brought up the good point, that you can 
talk about all the things that go into a smart antenna system, but then as you get into millimeter wave, the signal isn't <coughs> going as far and bouncing on as many things and being attenuated by as many things. So it's a whole different way of thinking. And maybe a smart antenna is not going to be that effective at millimeter wave, but it certainly uh, would be and will be, I suppose, at, at lower frequencies. Anyway, I'm, I'm sold on it. I think uh, every antenna we make from now on should be smart. <laughs> is there a certification uh, for that? <laughs> I, well, we have to do some experimenting, but I think we're going to be able to put a lot more people on the air at once. Uh, could I have the slides back, please? So uh, again, I, I didn't mean to make light of the people who are, do, who are doing steerable antennas because they're doing important things as well. Um, we, we heard from uh, a couple people about testing. Uh, testing is something I hadn't really thought of as an issue, but when you generate, when you de develop antennas, they have to be tested um, in either an open area test site or uh, in a very huge, or depending on the wavelength, in a very huge uh, shielded room so that you know where all of the, the different uh, emanations from that antenna are going. Uh, the ANSI C63.26 uh, committee is proposing a total radiated power test which would allow us to know the total power that's coming out of the antenna, which can even be measured in the near field. The beauty of that, obviously, being is that your shielded room doesn't have to be so big. Um, it it uh, requires some special equipment, obviously, but uh, the purpose of total radiated power, then, is to let you know where all the uh, energy is going, uh, but you don't have to get in the far field to measurement, measure it. It does not help you with the antenna pattern issues. So a combination of the two, and possibly patterns could be modeled versus uh, total, radiated, total, total radiated power being measured, uh, would give you a full picture of, of where your antenna is sending energy and then what could be done about the energy that's not going where you want it to go. Uh, again, Marty mentioned the appearance, and uh, we all agree that the FCC should not make rules to tell everyone to make pretty antennas. That would, that would be a, somewhat of a mistake. However, <laughs> and Mike Marcus uh, is, is the big proponent for this stuff, um, that it would be a lot easier for the rollout to get 5G all over the place if you didn't have people fighting it everywhere you go. And people fight it because of this, um, these, you know, these pictures that show you uh, things that don't have to look that way. Uh, we came up with, and this is what we showed you at the last meeting, uh, we came up with some pictures of the, some things of, that should look this way the way things should look. Where you have the, the picture on the upper left is a, just a small radiator that uh, Marty came up with. Hopefully you can't even see the one in the lower left. But that's, that's uh, a hidden antenna. Um, I was on a business trip and driving along a road and saw another one that I thought was kind of cute. That's the one in the lower middle. Um, a, a palm tree. Cell, cell tower. <laughs> and the one on the right will give credit to AT&T for. Um, the picture on the right evidently is an AT&T installation on a wooden pole. We've, we've recognized that wooden poles are the most difficult to add nice looking antennas to because they're wood and you don't have a center to run the wires down through. But evidently they did something because that thing at the top of this wooden pole is an AT&T small cell. Uh, in Pennsylvania that looks pretty good. Uh, the point 
So you can pass the money to him now, Brian. <laughs> we, we, we sold earlier, so. <laughs> Actually, I was just hoping to get a, an antenna outside my house. <laughs> Do you want to connect it or not? <laughs> I'll give you an antenna. <laughs> oh, boy. Onward, onward. Sorry I, sorry I did that. But, but we, we made, and we, we talked to people who put up antennas, including a uh, gentleman from Crown, Crown Castle, um, and he showed us other examples of some nice looking uh, antennas that they've put up. And then as we were discussing it, uh, the discussion came up about it, it may be interesting to make hidden antennas and nice looking antennas uh, in palm trees, or that look like palm trees, but if you make it so fancy that you can't maintain it, especially in a rural area, uh, that can be very serious. If, if your fancy looking hidden antenna falls down and you can't get anyone to put it back up right away, there may be an awful lot of life safety communications issues that come up. So it's important to balance uh, the, the nice appearance against the, the way to maintain it and, and keep it working under all conditions. So that, that's enough said about appearance. So it, it is important, again, the best I think the FCC could do about this is to convince people, convince um, municipalities that antennas could be made to look nice, but they, sh they have to be accessible <laughs> and maintainable. And for the carriers to realize that they'll have a much easier time rolling out 5G and any other antennas if they make it look a little nicer. Uh, we talked to some people about other antenna topics. Um, uh, one of our group members, uh, Danilo uh, Aracolo, at University of Illinois at Chicago is, is working on um, interference canceling, self-interference canceling antennas so you can run full duplex over that antenna. You can transmit and receive over the, on the same frequency over that same antenna, which is a really fascinating topic. Um, and I think in past years in the TAC, we, we considered this just as a way of using the spectrum more efficiently. And as that type of antenna gets out of the research stages and into practicability, I think we're going to be seeing more of them. Uh, Marty mentioned the fractal antennas. We had a very interesting discussion on what they are. But again, uh, it's not something we're seeing a lot of. And then another discussion on plasma physics uh, for antennas. Not sure I understand, understood the whole physical part of it, but it sounded very promising. And there is a company working on it. And uh, if if they're successful, I'm sure you're going to be seeing them. So we came up with some tentative conclusions. Uh, combining smart antenna and other technologies shows the greatest promise for shaping coverage areas and reducing interference protection areas, which could mean that we'll get major improvements in spectral efficiency. Uh, in short, in a cell, you have more people who are able to use it. Uh, smart antennas offer different attributes, which Marty mentioned, at uh, different frequencies, particularly millimeter wave is going to have a whole different way of working than, than at the lower bands. Um, FCC action could be used to create, uh, to creatively use the spectrum and still allow interference protection. A lot of the rules today are based on the old way of thinking about uh, the way antennas radiate. So we may have to revisit some of those rules to, to allow for these smart antennas. Um, and then as we were talking, we realized that, and I'm sure you realize this too, that just uh, as, as a general rule, uh, 
rule, the general practice, FCC rules should be re-examined from time to time as new antenna te technologies come about so that we see if they're all appropriate. And that's not a dictum, that's just something that we should be thinking about all the time. We've also concluded that Okay. Um, that uh, testing could be simplified. If, if some of the protocols that are out there, and they're not necessarily rules, but they are uh, protocols on testing. Uh, oops. I'm sorry. I, I skipped ahead <laughs> again the wrong way. Um, the, I'll get to the rules in a minute, or to the testing. Um, the advances in technology let us put in smaller and more aesthetic antennas just because of the smaller wavelengths and we can have smaller antennas. And as we've said a couple of times, we, we're not expecting any legislation for aesthetics. But um, there, um, I, I added that there are certain minimum installation standards that should be encouraged, that uh, you shouldn't have wires hanging out. Not that there's rules saying you can't, but uh, maybe let everyone know that that's not the best thing. Uh, the uh, smart antennas, um, we're looking, these, now we're, we've gotten into possible, and we're not saying these are our actionable recommendations, but these are topics from which our actionable recommendations will come in a couple months. And the smart antennas, uh, we'll develop rule approaches to accommodate highly directional antennas. For example, one way might be to base things on field strength limits instead of emitted limits. Um, innovative antennas uh, let's allow uh, certain innovative antennas to be certified for Part 15 use uh, in de detachable devices. Currently, and I realize the reasons for these are more complex, but a lot of Part 15 devices don't allow detachable antennas, and maybe that could be reconsidered. I don't have an answer, but uh, reconsidering that to allow some uh, antenna um, improvements or improvements in, in antenna technology might be a good thing. <coughs> and also, um, <coughs> Can we consider operation in passive bands? And this, this has to do with uh, you know, greater than 100 gigahertz and mostly uh, our interrelationship with the military, um, which right now the rules pretty much preclude non-military uh, devices from being in, the, those, in that range because of fear about side lobes. But if you can demonstrate very small side lobes in some of our new antenna technologies, can we reconsider some of those uh, agreements with NTIA? Um, in the small cell rollout, uh, again, we've said this num numerous times, but we want to urge the industry to set aesthetic standards for pole placement. And also to define certain ne necessary aspects of small cell installations that local ju jurisdictions may not modify in their siting deliberations. That came from back uh, with big cells when, and I've been to many zoning hearings, when the zoning board says to the people who've, who've shown up to usually be against the tower going up, so you know, tell us about anything, but we're not allowed to consider health effects. And that went a long way to allowing a lot of those cell sites to go in. Uh, maybe there are certain things with small cells that could also be precluded from zoning board consideration. More technical things that are necessary for a small cell to work that they shouldn't be considering. And I don't know what all those things are. And when we get to our actual actionable recommendations, we sh may come up with a list. But it may be very useful for the FCC to not allow a, a different consideration of every part of the antenna design at every municipality in the country. 
Uh, now, we're up to testing, finally. That's what I started talking about. Um, some of uh, our people, our members who do testing, thought that some of the protocols for testing were overly complex, and they gave us some examples of the huge amount of testing that's necessary on some of the cell antennas that they're, they're planning to put out there. Uh, so we, we may come up with a specific list for actionable recommendations that, that can be simplified. Um, we were asked by one of our speakers to have the FCC clarify power measurement measurements um, for Part 15 uh, Uni 1 antennas, and we'll, we'll consider that as an actionable recommendation. Um, we'll explore new uh, measurement approaches. Again, I mentioned uh, the ANSI committee uh, with total radiated power um, using industry standard measurement uh, procedures near fixed transmitters. And then finally, uh, we were asked by one of our speakers to allow static testing of dynamic antennas. If we can come up with a test protocol, a static test protocol where you don't have to go around and dynamically uh, repoint the antenna beam every, every which way and then go test it, uh, that would save them a lot of time. So we will consider all of these topics for actionable recommendations and come back to this group with a more specific list. Any more comments, Marty? So with that, we thank you. And if there are any questions. Questions, and we'll need to do this fairly quickly. We have been I've running behind. You didn't, uh, you didn't actually, you, you thus far have accomplished it, but with addition of a normal time, we would be uh, losing 10 to five to ten minutes per, per group so far. But, but I'm not seeing any questions, so. Just, just I have oh. a couple of on the bridge. And somebody on the bridge. Somebody, somebody on the bridge. On the bridge. Can Sorry. hear something. Yep. Go ahead. If you're on the bridge with a question. Yeah, this is David. Um, this relates to the uh, small cell sites. Um, and really two questions. You know, the comments that were made about maintainability, et cetera, of some of these sites versus, you know, visibility. Uh, I've been surprised at the degree to which people just assume the antenna needs to go at the top of the pole. Uh, if you're already at the top of a high hill, you know, putting it actually below the power lines makes life a lot easier, but it's just become, a, you know, and you have basically just as good range. Um, uh, I, it, it seems as if there's just a total lack of uh, imagination going on amongst the folks that are trying, not just imagination, but technical astuteness amongst the folks that are trying to field these things. <laughs> That's the other side for you, Brian. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, so the question is, you know, is there something that we can do, we can do to, to, to help that? Because the planning of these things is going with a, a worst case scenario. Uh, and then later I have a question about the health issue. Well, the, the only comment I can make is that we're still in early days. Uh, at least one of the uh, pictures that uh, we showed you uh, was a street lamp and the uh, vendor has figured out a way to actually plug the cell site into the top of the street lamp with a standard uh, connector and claims that uh, he can, uh, uh, in the ideal case, produce a complete cell site for $7,000. So people are being creative, and I assume they're smart yeah. enough to solve the kinds of problems I, you're, uh, you're talking yeah. about. So maybe this has to do with circulating best practice because there are definitely vendors that are coming up with smart ideas. Um, that includes the observation I made about the height. That didn't come from me. That came from a vendor realizing it saved them a lot of money to be lower on the pole. Uh, so I wonder if there's something that could be done about somehow exchanging best practice because it, it doesn't seem to be getting through. Yeah, I think you saw some of that in, in some of the slides, so it's a good thought. And Brian's got his uh, rebuttal. Well, yeah. up, so go ahead. <laughs> no, in, in a way, I agree. I think you know the need for best practices probably would be helpful. 
Um, I, I was just going to say, you know, that was one example of, of an antenna on top of a pole. I, I'm also familiar with some that aren't at the top of poles and, and on street lamps and things like that. So there's a, a, a variety of things going out there. A lot depends upon, you know, what, what the cell site needs to do, what it needs to cover, especially when we get uh, into millimeter wave. You know, we're, we're learning too and, and looking at different propagation characteristics and so forth and where antenna placements are. We're certainly looking at that very closely, and I, I think it, it will continue to be looked at. Yeah, I think this best practices is a good, good one, uh, since personally and my company is very heavily involved in some of this. There's so many factors that go into siting. It, it, it is a, it, a remarkably complex subject that you wouldn't believe was that complex for now effects and edges and all sorts of strange things to get into. But, yeah, agreed. I, I've fear that due to that complexity, the approach that uh, a number of antenna operators are taking is just yeah, designed for the worst case. Yeah, that's right. Right? And they're hugely over-engineering. And then, of course, they're surprised when they get pushback. Yep. Um, a different question is the, uh, it's really a jurisdictional question. I don't know if anyone knows the answer, but I, kn I, I do know that these, the safety health issue is is sort of considered out of scope and yet it seems like we're now you know basically putting these things beaming straight into people's bedrooms very close to their bedrooms and at you know and at high duty cycles and sometimes directional but at very low powers and, you no know, i understand that but 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 you know our some of our own national labs wouldn't permit their employees to be exposed to that same radiation. Right. So yeah, there's, a, there's a opening a very know, what, long discussion. I probably <laughs> I, I think I'm gonna suggest we right. don't take take that one. I, I well, since I oversaw I that activity at who, Motorola who for some in, years, I, 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 I I'd be happy to talk to you about it at length, but it's it's a very okay. long complex subject. But the, okay. the FCC my key question is who does have that jurisdiction? That accommodate that. Yeah the SAR the SAR rules that Marty's pointing out do exist in FCC, so they are there. Um, but it, it's, it's a, David, as is often the case, you brought up a very complex subject with this one uh, that probably needs to be discussed in a larger forum with people with expertise in the specific area. Okay. Julie, do you want to say you yeah. have the last yeah. word here? Yeah. I'll try to make it short. Um, and maybe if you could consider as part of your recommendations follow on work, I mean, there's two things that stand out in my mind. <laughs> uh, the one is on spectrum efficiency, spectrum management, because the way we've approached things historically through the years are, are based on maximum everything. <laughs> so we've got static antennas with a fixed gain. <laughs> we say if you point in that direction to this service, you're going to interfere. So we, you know, maybe we'll cap the EIRP. Moving to an environment where, or if it's in trust system, you can manage all these pieces. Mm -hmm. We're moving to an environment now is, well, that's not a problem because I can reduce my antenna gain or my power <laughs> in that direction and not interfere. <laughs> and so I think about how can we take advantage <laughs> of the characteristics of the new capabilities that we have to make better use of the spectrum. <laughs> Uh, and, and maybe that's a more detailed follow-on uh, study, but because I think we, we've hit places where we look at it and we say, hey, I can make that work, <laughs> in part because of these technologies that histor where historically would, we would have said, no, no, you know, the maximum EIRP is this and, and we can't allow it because we're relying on uh, electronic control. The other that comes to mind, and I know the folks at our lab wrestle with this all the time, but now I went from, uh, never mind the equipment itself has become so dynamic and operating in multiple bands and multi-modulation formats when, when gone from, you probably heard me say before, the day when I put the device on a stand, I turned it on and made a measurement, I'm done. <laughs> You know, to, to a point where we've been wrestling before with now it's got all these different modes it can operate in combinations and we're saying, well, it'd be silly if we would do 2,000 tests, let's pick the ones that are most like. Now we've got an antenna <laughs> that is much more dynamic. And, you know, do we take an approach that says, well, let's test it every which way to make sure we've captured <laughs> the maximum uh, uh, 
gain, so to speak, of the device, and now we've made it even more complicated. Mm -hmm. So how do we, you know, and, and maybe this is the next round. <laughs> how do we deal with these things going forward? I th uh, maybe there's just one third point. Is, is capturing a little bit of the flavor of the frequency dependency of this stuff because it's not magic at every frequency. We're, able, we're, we're better able as we go higher up <laughs> than, you know, and, and talking about VHF and, 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 and sometimes people think about this like they, they look at it and maybe we can steer the beams, but you can't make them quite as narrow. <laughs> at least I don't think you can <laughs> uh, fit because of the physics of it l lower. So just, just uh, so what I'm suggesting is maybe think about okay, we got these great capabilities, how should the FCC change its thinking about the way it approaches spectrum management and equipment authorization, things like that? And maybe do it by band, that would, yeah. that's a really yeah. good. It doesn't have to be band by band, but no, just no, some no. flavor. No, yeah, you know, high medium, yeah. but. Right. We will do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our UAS team. Mm -hmm. and okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm John Chapin, and I'm here with the uh, other folks who have led parts of the work in this working group, uh, Stephen Hayes of Ericsson and Reza Arefi of Intel. So uh, we'll be uh, tag-teaming the briefing today. Uh, this is on the communication strategies for unmanned aircraft systems, and we have uh, multiple FCC liaisons who we've been working very closely with and getting lots of support from. Uh, numerous uh, contributors and uh, participants to the group. Uh, and we have also had on the right-hand column here uh, some quite uh, superb contributions from subject matter experts uh, who have uh, given us quite a lot of help from their, their particular perspectives. Uh, a UAV, you'll hear me saying that, is an unmanned aerial vehicle. A UAS, an unmanned aircraft system, comprises the UAV and the ground station and the communication links between it, all of which have to work correctly for the system to function safely and efficiently, and uh, thus the UAS is often what we are focusing on for requirements. And we'll use the term C2 for command and control. Uh, so these next two slides just recap the uh, topics that we were asked to look at and the particular priorities of our stakeholders at the FCC. And the high-level bullet is the first one, uh, that we were tasked to study the spectrum issues for UAS. Uh, command and control is the one that everybody thinks about, C2, but there's many other spectrum utilizations of UAS, uh, some of which uh, may be quite significant, uh, and so we were asked to look at those as well. And there's a number of uh, more sp specific questions uh, supporting uh, that high-level question, but I won't read them out loud here. <coughs> okay, so we, uh, uh, I should say I'm quite impressed with the amazing work that the other groups uh, have accomplished thus far this year. We got a bit of a late start, and we were even a little bit later than that to split ourselves into subgroups and, and uh, start working in a parallel fashion. So I regret that we have perhaps not made quite as much progress as the other groups, uh, but we have uh, made a good stab in, in three areas. Uh, use of existing systems and standards uh, for UAS, and that's what Stephen Hayes of Ericsson will be presenting first. Secondly, uh, getting started on some spectrum availability analysis. We'll hear from Reza Arefi of Intel second. And the third subgroup, regulatory technical analysis, is what I will brief third. So I'll hand it over to Stephen to get started. <laughs> okay, I really just need just one. <laughs> okay, so we don't get feedback here. Uh, thank you. I should mention that as I start that I'm actually a co-chair of the group with Brian Daly, so it's not just me running the show myself. So uh, the goal of this subgroup is really to look at what type of systems could be used in UAVs, uh, because that would allow us then to do a more in-depth analysis of the uh, whether it could meet requirements, et cetera. So we kind of need to understand first what systems we were looking at. <laughs> So when you think of a UAV, what people normally think of is the command and controlling, but it turns out there are a lot of other things that UAVs will need for uh, communication. So we tried to come up with a list of the different communication aspects that were needed. So here we have a, a list, and this list will be used essentially to evaluate the applicable of diff applicability of different technologies. 
I also want to indicate that the goal isn't here isn't to pick a technology, but just to understand the technology so we can use it in evaluating aspects such as uh, the spectrum requirements and the suitability, et cetera. So the types of communications that we see from a UAV, uh, you'll have your normal command and control, and then you may also have sort of a fallback command and control. Uh, UAS is, most systems I've seen have the assumption that we have some sort of management system called UTM, UAS Traffic Manager, and there's, tra there's communication links toward that. You may have a payload such as video that's being uh, sent from the UAV. You have detect and avoid, which is similar to what cars have or will have uh, to avoid other cars. You may also have sense and avoid, which would be a technovoid would keep you from running into uh, another drone. Sense and avoid will hopefully keep you from running into bro birds and buildings, etc. Uh, it could be radar, so in that case, it would add to the uh, uh, noise floor. There's also a requirement on some drones that they broadcast their identification so that if you see one flying overhead, law enforcement come out and identify it and network tracking so that uh, you can determine also what a UAV is, but not necessarily without requiring that you be physically present uh, to read the broadcast identity. So those are some of the uh, types of communications that a drone may have to support. And then to evaluate it, um, we will look at various aspects that uh, are going to require for these communication capabilities, such as the availability or reliability, capacity, coverage, security. Uh, integration, I think, is an important one. If you had to support all of these capabilities with discrete systems, a small UAV might have so many antennas it never got off the ground. Uh, so you want integration. Other things such as latency, deployment issues, whether or not uh, you need to deploy a network to support it, and the cost of the equipment itself. So these are some of the aspects that we'll look at. Now, not all drones are created equal, so we tried to categorize some different scenarios that we would use for the evaluation. Uh, 400 feet seems to be kind of a magic dividing, dividing line that uh, FAA and other administrations uh, have kind of picked uh, as an upper boundary for these small hobbyist drones and uh, uh, the less, uh, or, well, small drones. So we divided it into a zone above 400 feet and a zone below 400 feet. Within, under the 400 feet we added, we subdivided that. And you have nearby drones, which are ones that are within a certain radius of the operator. And then remote ones, which could be miles away because the communication characteristics are gonna be quite different. So given the various types of communications and the characteristics we described, we're gonna to try to evaluate in these different scenarios. So here you see uh, the type of communications that we viewed as were probably required. In this case, if you have 400 feet nearby line of sight, these are the ones you think of as the hobbyist drones or the ones that might be used uh, for inspection, but you have an operator and they can see the drone, so they're flying it fairly fairly close by. And they don't require near as many communication capabilities as we expect of some of the other drones. They require command and control, uh, they, uh, broadcast ID or network tracking may be required in some cases both, but a lot of them, such as the UTM communications or the Technovoid, they don't really need that. Um, and here you see a list of different technologies we've we've looked at that could be used to fulfill these and, and whether or not they're able to fulfill the different sort of functionality uh, that we've described. So we include like network cellular, which includes 4G and 5G, uh, 3GPP side link. This is a 3GPP function for talking from one device to another, similar to DSRC. Um, Wi-Fi, satellite, um, custom unlicensed, uh, 
ADSB, which is something this actually refers to ADSB and its variants that would be used for uh, an alternative method of detecting a void and broadcast ID in DSRC. So these are some of the technologies that could be considered uh, for this category. If we need to the next category, this is you're still under 400 feet, but you're beyond visual line of sight or you're remote. And here you see there's more communication characteristics or capabilities that are required. You'll have to have a connection to the uh, traffic manager. You may need backup communication depending on how much autonomy the device has. Uh, you'll need detect and avoid and probably some sort of uh, sense and avoid capabilities. So it, more communication requirements are um, are probably required. Some of them we need more information and more analysis to actually find out. For example, detect and avoid. It's not actually clear if this will actually be required. And here you see a somewhat um, a similar list of the technologies and where they could fulfill the, the capabilities. Uh, I won't go through all the check marks and we'll need to do more evaluation in each of these cells but this is to give an indication of sort of our thinking at this point. And finally, the last one is if you're above 400 feet. And this is a kind of a wide range. It goes from 401 feet to infinity, uh, or maybe to the top of the atmosphere, I guess. <laughs> uh, we haven't really specified where the top of this is. Uh, but it requires uh, even more communications capabilities. In addition, it may require aeronautical communication systems to be incorporated. Um, and then if you go here, you have a list of the candidate systems. And um, again, I won't go through it, but you can see that there's um, uh, quite a few candidates that we'll need to evaluate. And I think that's the end of the analysis that we've done so far. I think the expectations will continue on this and I hope to uh, sort of refine the analysis with more uh, quantitative values. But this is the direction that we're going right now in understanding which systems and standards would be applicable to UASs. Thank you. <laughs> Julie thought you were done. <laughs> I thought we got back Mish. on track on the time. <laughs> just war he's just warming up. As they say in the circus, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Yeah. So this, these are the answers. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> um, so we, we started looking at, in terms of spectrum av availability, um, we wanted to look at Spectrum, spectrum needs overall in terms of the amount of spectrum, the type of spectrum, low frequency, high frequency, with respect to the kind of functions that the UAVs are supposed to have or based on what we know now, the applications and the different missions, whether it's public safety or, or industrial or transportation, agriculture, surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. So we started by looking at uh, in general, as you do with, with spectrum, what, what kind of um, service allocation would suitable spectrum for UAVs fall under? So mobile service or not called mobile service, other, uh, other allocations. And when we talk, talk about allocations, as we look at variety of bands, of course, where these services that UAVs could operate under, whether for each band, whether they're primary or secondary, whether there is a, uh, where there are sp specific footnotes, international footnotes, FCC footnotes, and they're not always the same. Um, uh, whether there's uh, accept aeronautical mobile uh, designation to the band, which uh, we have seen talk about that in, in, in a little bit more later. And whether there are ad adequate service rules in place for, for these bands for aeronautical 
or for aerial, let's say, operation to be to be uh, to be allowed and, and used. Um, and specifically, this this lack of ser service rules uh, uh, in in some cases could be could be problematic, and, and we would like to uh, get to the um, get details on various bands for that. Um, just just an example. There's there's no significance of the frequency here. Um, just 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 a page out of the rules where you could see um, bands with mobile allocation. Um, uh, and, uh, and other allocations, including some that do not like to have aeronautical operation there. And these are generally uh, on, uh, on the same band or adjacent to um, some, some sensitive uh, services, such as passive services, and, and, and we have been uh, cognizant of that in, 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 our, in our analysis. Um, now we've heard about categorization, and, and and the importance of categorization is that it, it has spectrum implications. Um, the, the 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 kind of UAVs operating in different categories that we just saw Stephen talked about have different characteristics in terms of because of their mission and their application, and those characteristics, for instance, uh, transmit power of of could be different. As we know, these are these, especially small UAVs, are very power restricted. Most of the uh, the power goes to the batteries for for flying. There's not not much left for communication, um, and so transmit power is important. Um, and transit power is what creates also interference. So so that that's why the um, it has uh, in terms of uh, spectrum implications. Um, and coexistence and protection of incumbents becomes important. Um, the, the altitude uh, is, is important. Um, again, that has implications on not just supporting the, the UAV with the kind of communication that it needs, but also in terms of uh, protection of other services. Uh, receiver performance uh, relates to complexity and, and, and cost. There are some aspects that maybe could be dealt with. Uh, with, with fancy systems, but uh, some uh, uh, low-cost, smaller UAVs might not have all that. So, and also the operational environment, which has, which has again, depending on the category, uh, whether you're dealing with it with a built-up area where you get non-line of sight a lot of times, or whether you are in an open area, that again is related to the, categ the, the categorization which has spectrum implications, and we talk about some of these spectrum implications. Um, this is um, just, a, just a high level that we will, uh, we will produce to give people a, a kind of qualitative view of the requirements of different functions uh, in terms of reliability, latency, and bandwidth requirements um, for, for whatever is worth. I mean, I, at least I like high-level pictures before getting into details. We saw that. that so we, we, we will be filling this out as, as we go, as we make more progress in, in the details and the quantitative analysis. Um, in terms of estimation of spectrum needs, and, and we say estimation because there are so many factors involved and so many variations and, and different things which, um, but the, de the, the determining factor are the technical performance requirements that, that these UAVs, depending on their mission and their application, need to have. Uh, a certain peak data rate, for instance, uh, the aerial capacity, uh, the, 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 the expected device density, spectral efficiency, um, and reliability and also uh, interference mitigation techniques uh, uh, or requirements for that if, if uh, for protection of incumbents. And, and, and you can appreciate that, 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 that by having, l having different performance targets in terms of latency, in terms of peak throughput, spectral efficiency would impact the amount of spectrum that you need in order to complete a mission in order to to uh, um, uh, for for the UAV to to operate, so we will have we will be having a few examples based on different uh, 
key technical targets. Um, right now, what we have, you, well, you will see in the next couple of slides, slides are a collection of some of these technical performance targets, not, not the estimation. The estimation, uh, we have started doing that, but, but uh, we'll, that will come later. Uh, but they, it will be the estimation will be based on some of the parameters like this. For instance, this is what 3GPP used in their release 15 UAS studies. And you see some assumptions here in terms of, for instance, command and control latency of 50 millisecond uh, or, or, or a, um, a, uh, a throughput of 50, mega, mega, 50 uh, megabit per second for, um, for payload. These are targets. And, and how, uh, and, and these could be translated um, once you have, for instance, uh, uh, assumptions on, on spectral efficiency, you could, you could translate them uh, very simply to uh, some uh, spectrum requirements. Another, another set of examples, this is more granular, this is an input from, from CTIA <coughs> on, on for, for different uh, applications, for instance, uh, video streaming, um, uh, real-time C2, et cetera. And, and the, the, the throughput requirements have um, impact on the amount of spectrum that, that is needed. Um, spectral efficiency here because become, uh, becomes uh, a key element here, um, sp specifically because the, in cases, in, in many cases, it becomes the bottleneck where you, where the system needs to, to needs to react to. Um, uh, what we call, for instance, sellage spectral efficiency, um, where the, the UAV is the is the farthest to the base station or where it's the farthest to the um, uh, to the operator. Uh, that is where the, where the spectral efficiency is lowest because of the the environment. And, and that's where the, usually where the, the, the most uh, um, uh, need for, for spectrum comes, comes in. Um, a, a few observations based on the preliminary studies that we have done converting these requirements on, on, on throughput and spectral efficiency and, and, and latency into some uh, megahertz numbers, so to speak. Um, uh, Latency uh, is, is, is important, is, is critical. Um, there are two ways of looking at latency. One is the packet latency that, that, that usually in, in, in cellular communications and or other terrestrial communications we we'll look at, but also the latency in terms of delivery of a, a, a bunch of data, um, whether it's a, a few bytes of control or whether it's uh, um, a picture or whatever, from point A to point B knowing that part of it will be over the air. Uh, that latency is, is also having uh, uh, impact on the amount of spectrum, the bigger, the, how big of a pipe you need to in order to make that transfer. Um, uh, payload may require up to hundreds of megahertz of, of bandwidth, depending on whether you're sending, um, real, for instance, real-time video, whether it's, uh, it's uh, uh, um, uh, compressed or uncompressed. Uh, knowing that, for instance, maybe some smaller, low-cost UAVs might not have the, the onboard processing to do comp compression, that that is um, that comes into picture. Um, uh, sense and avoid or detect and avoid that that also could require up to hundreds of megahertz. Just just looking at, for instance, the situations where you have given the the, the speed that these things uh, travel, the distance to a to an obstacle. Um, for instance, a bird com coming through, um, the size of the object, all of these, and the, and the power that, that can be on board used for this function. Uh, if you want a, a resolution of, a, for instance, 10, 20 centimeters at 20, 30 meters, that, would re that could require a lot, of, uh, a lot of spectrum. So we've looked at this, and we looking at um, all of this, we see that there's, there will be need for uh, some functions require low bandwidth, some functions require high bandwidth. And when you look at the, the um, mobile broadband spectrum that's uh, 
um, that exist right now collectively, all of these could, could be, uh, um, uh, could, could provide for, for the, the spectrum needs of uh, uh, not, not a single band, but collectively uh, that, that uh, can be accommodated. Um, so we will look. We will be looking at. We have started actually looking at all the all the different uh, bands, licensed bands, unlicensed bands, the ones that are also under consideration for for mobile broadband. Uh, and we will be looking at uh, the, the 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 scope of their licenses for each band. Uh, what are the incumbents in each band? Uh, the regulatory status. Whether the service rules exist, and um, and we look at. We look at all of these to 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 have a big better picture of what's available and what's not and what can be used. Um, this slide and next slide um, look at some of the regulatory challenges when it comes to spectrum. Uh, what we see, for instance, um, once the autonomous operation uh, gets is is put in place or is ready to be put in place. Um, whether that has an impact on having uh, a dedicated spectrum for command and control, and whether in that situation, whether command and control could have different spectrum requirements because there are slightly different functions there. That, that uh, is, is a consideration and, and a challenge how to, how to implement that. Uh, also, legacy conditions and definitions, we see that um, there are Designations, for instance, we talked about this, um, except they're not called mobile designation, uh, or, or in, in some cases, uh, the rules talk about aircrafts, operational aircrafts, whether these rules, w which were written before the time of UAVs, whether they're really talking about a, a large manned aircraft, or the rules could also apply to a, to a, to a UAV. Uh, large or small. Um, so a, a, a kind of revisiting of, once we have the, the bands in place, revisiting of uh, these conditions to, to, uh, to make sure that um, uh, those conditions are still applicable to UAVs or not uh, would, be, uh, would be another thing that needs to be, needs to be carried out, reevaluated. Re and and last, last item, um, historically, Different functions were done by different technologies, different spectrum bands. For instance, command and control has its own band. Uh, radar has its own band. Uh, uh, communications have, have their own band. Um, and these were done with different, are done with different, different radios, different modules, um, different subsystems. Um, looking at now with the, um, especially for for the category of, drone, of, of UAVs that are, that are small, looking at the capabilities of radio interfaces that are now being developed, and if these f all these functions or some of these functions could be integrated within the same ra radio interface and be done on the same channel, whether do we still need to have, um, for instance, command and control be done on a band, on a spectrum band separate than one that does, for instance, detecting of objects. And 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 this way, um, maybe looking at um, uh, these potential integration of of different functions within the same radio interface that would um, uh, save a lot of spectrum. It would also save in terms of cost and complexity of of, of the UAVs. So this is another another challenge to look at. Um, I think that that's that's the last slide I have. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're terrible time. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, then I will go quickly through the last section here. That would be here. great. That Thank would be you. much appreciated, I think, by the whole group. Okay. So the regulatory technical analysis, uh, we observe that the advent of affordable UAVs uh, significantly increases the expected number and density of flights. This is a chart of prediction uh, from the FAA. Uh, if you take a band that's licensed for terrestrial use, uh, and you elevate a large number of devices to UAV altitudes, uh, that changes the assumptions that underlie previous regulatory decisions and creates potential for increased interference. Uh, 
So there's a couple examples on this slide of interesting regulatory challenges that we could foresee arising. Uh, so uh, if I have two geographically neighboring licensees and life is good, and then one of them takes uh, some of their receivers and puts them on UAVs and flies them at altitude, and now those UAVs are getting interference, may they claim harm? May they come to the FCC for seeking regulatory <laughs> relief? Uh, yeah, well, we don't, we don't know about that. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. And similarly, on the transmit side, out-of-band emissions might have to be reconsidered if you start putting a lot of transmitters at altitude. So uh, what we're doing in this part of the uh, UAS working group is considering possible paths the FCC might take to address challenges like this, identifying issues that are critical for those decisions, and using that to guide which technical studies we would do, because it's a very complex space and we want to make sure our technical studies offer high value to uh, what the, the FCC needs. So uh, to take an example of a possible path, uh, the FCC might classify low and slow UAS as ground stations and simply say anything you can do on the ground you can do on a UAV that is, say, less than 400 feet and less than 100 miles per hour, which is the boundary selected by the FCC for, for a lot of their, by the FAA for their, many of their operations. Uh, that would perhaps be attractive because it provides immediate access to a broad class of spectrum equipment and systems. Um, and it basically in one fell swoop takes a lot of questions off the table and frees the FCC regulatory bandwidth to focus on the needs of higher and faster UAS. Another path the FCC might take would be to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to treat those aircraft as being ground stations. But what we'll do instead is, in cases where the existing rules are silent regarding aerial operations, we'll define a standard way that a terrestrial license extends to operation of stations on aircraft. So if it's less than 400 feet and slow, um, it we give it the same kind of transmit authorizations and protections as you would have on the ground. Uh, if it's between 400 and 1,200 feet, and these numbers, by the way, come from FAA regulatory environments, uh, transmission would be authorized, but you have to coordinate with the folks you impact with, and receivers can't claim harm unless somebody's violating FCC rules. And if it's above 1,200 feet, you might need a waiver. So that's an example of a way that you could set up a defined extension of a terrestrial license into the aerial environment uh, and then start uh, applying that to different uh, situations. Uh, this has some attractive features uh, and in particular it would clarify terrestrial license rights in cases where people might have disagreements about them leading to uh, increased interference as the number of UAVs going up. Uh, but again, those are just examples of things the FCC might do. Um, and what they do is they lead to a set of questions, and these are my last two slides. Uh, in terms of things that we could study in the TAC that would help the FCC figure out how to navigate its way through this thicket, uh, <laughs> potential. Uh, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, assessing the potential for interference to terrestrial users in band, if I've got a lot of UAVs, uh, because even a low and slow UAV uh, exceeds the assumptions that were used for lots of existing uh, interference and coexistence analyses. Similarly, out-of-band issues. Um, if you're out-of-band, you've got a neighboring service that is perhaps noise-limited, uh, and you assume that all of the transmitters were on the, in the ground clutter, and now a bunch of them are up in the air. Um, does that change things in a significant way? Uh, enforcement. Um, if you put a lot of transmitters in the air moving around at 100 miles an hour, you can expect that interference will be intermittent and will vary. Um, and um, how can we assure that we don't get ourselves into a situation that nobody has protected operation anymore? Um, six, question four, um, there is situations where these terrestrial allocations share bands with aeronautical allocations. That is a delicate balancing act. And we do need to assess whether um, in doing these kinds of, of operations in a regulatory way would uh, change the impact on aeronautical users sufficiently to require new mitigations. Uh, and then finally, in response to some of our stakeholder questions, uh, what conditions must be true about a band in order for transmissions from UAVs to be authorized without a detailed band sharing study, which would add a lot of cost and delay? And what conditions must be true in order for current certified radio devices to be used without additional compliance testing? So that's basically a forward pointer to where we uh, hope to go, and we'll, we'll make as much progress as possible in the next quarter. Thank you. Great. Thank you, and thank you especially for picking up the pace at the end here. Um, Dale, you're up first. I've got a page here, but 
<laughs> Dale, we, we love your inputs, and so if we don't have time for all of your page today, please send it afterwards. <laughs> the, the question is, is it's a small I, page. In, in, in this world where every, everything is connected, of course, everything is subject to jamming and spoofing and so forth, and you didn't mention cybersecurity in this, and it just sort of begs for it, it seems to me, like some of the things you're saying, boy, people trying to do things deliberately instead of inadvertently could cause some pretty bad, conceivably cause pretty bad things to happen. I don't know whether that's within the scope hmm. of your assignment or not, but it, it did we'll occur to me. We'll take a note on it, but not take the time to discuss it right now based on where we stand. Uh, we have had significant discussions about that so far. Thank you. Glad you did say, have enforcement in there. <laughs> okay. That was a short version of your list. I'm not seeing <laughs> any other other cards up. <laughs> Don't invite. <laughs> so <laughs> let's yeah. Let's move on and, and thank you so much for really very expansive coverage of this area and really digging into in each of the three areas and dividing it up. I think you've divided it well also. So you gave all the apologies at the front. I didn't think the apologies were necessary. <laughs> you making good progress. Melanie, you have the cleanup role. Yes, and a clicker. Thank you. Thank you too. Um, so, given that I'm the last presenter, I think for the day, you are, and the working group that everyone fortunately is the most familiar with, I will move through at a pretty rapid pace and make this more of a teaser for the report that you'll get um, in December. So. Um, I'm leading the, I'm chairing the mobile device theft prevention working group. Um, here is the list of all of our participants. Uh, so I've included a slide here of what our focus areas are. I will not read it to you, but um, generally we have broken this down into three focus areas for the group this year. Uh, international engagement, refreshing our statistics to be able to determine whether or not mobile thefts of mobile devices are continuing to decline as we've seen um, through some anecdotal data so far, and also uh, what improvements or enhancements to the database that was created through the working group, the stolen phone checker, um, should be made at this point. So on international engagement, we are continuing to engage with our South American counterparts, particularly we've been focusing um, on discussions with Colombia, Brazil, Peru, and Costa Rica. Uh, the FCC has been a huge help in helping to organize some of those discussions, including a very productive face-to-face -face meeting that we had with everyone in the room at the same time that I think was very beneficial to be able to share experiences and hear how other countries are, are engaged on this issue and you know the different uses of whitelists and blacklists and everything and the challenges that they're facing. Um, so we will continue those discussions moving forward. Um, we are continuing to work with law enforcement um, to identify any enhancements that need to be made to the stolen phone checker. We're also working to explore and identify if there are any new scenarios where the stolen phone checker may be useful. Um, and continuing to promote the existence of the stolen phone checker throughout um, the law enforcement community. Uh, we're working with the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the local law enforcement agencies. As I've said in previous sessions, we had focused on Washington, D.C., New York, and San Francisco, given their um, involvement in this issue and the fact that they had been on the record as already keeping track of um, thefts, et cetera, so we are doing that. And then on refreshing statistics, we have the CTIA annual Harris poll, and I will walk through um, some of those results uh, here in a moment. Uh, continuing to work with our law enforcement counterparts and friends and um, reviewing the flow charts that were part of the original uh, report back in 2014. So those so next steps on the working group, we will continue to collect information and fill in these gaps and promote this stolen phone checker both domestically and internationally through our work with GSMA. I think that was pretty quick for You're the doing status. Extraordinary. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'll Making just go up oh. for the four that preceded. Exactly. <laughs> Always picking up their a team effort here. 
Um, so I'll move through this quickly, and then we'll include this also in the report. But we do have the results from the uh, Harris poll that CTIA commissioned. Um, and the, the poll was conducted uh, earlier this year on over 1,000 adults who own and use a personal smartphone, tablet, or both. Um, and essentially, we were trying to gauge consumer awareness and adoption of some of the security and anti-theft tools that are available. So uh, the use of pins and passwords has remained pretty consistent over the past few years, hovering in the 70%. Um, it's up drastically from 2012 when this question was first asked. You know, initially it was around 50%. We're now up into the 70s. The top three reasons that have been um, that cited as reasons for using pins is, was because it was included in their smartphones hardware in order to block specific people from accessing smartphones and um, the features were easy to install. Among the reasons not to use pins and passwords was consumers felt they had no needs for security. Uh, it was too much of a hassle and there are too many passwords to now keep track of. <laughs> um, Running device software updates has also remained pretty consistent over the um, recent years. I have a breakdown there of how frequently respondents cited that they do um, install the updates. 47% said they do it every time, 27% almost every time, 12% sometimes, and we only have 5% that said never, um, so that's encouraging. Um, Consistent with past years, about 47% have software on their mobile devices that scans for malware or antivirus programs. 17% um, reported that the program came pre-installed, and 30% subsequently installed a program. Around 29% said that they do not have any software. Um, so 65% of respondents agreed that they prefer that security features be automatically enabled, which is consistent with um, the responses that said that one of the key reasons why folks use pins and passwords is because it was already on their devices and prompted them to do it. 35% um, reported preferring that these features not be automatically enabled, but they prefer to do it themselves. And there's a fancy little chart there. Um, so over the past 12 months, 24% uh, reported that they had experienced phishing or a cyber attack on their mobile devices. And all of these, as you see, are either around the same percent or have decreased this year, which is good. 12% experienced a malware attack, um, which is down from last year. And around 6% reported experiencing some version of ransomware. Among the recovery methods, 51% reboot or reset their device, around 50% um, are being protected by malware detection software, and 7% uh, successfully avoided or uh, do not click on links, something that we all should do. Um, moving on, so on the um, find your phone capabilities, around 57% of smartphone owners responded that they were aware that they have these capabilities on the device that allow them to remotely lock, locate, or wipe their phone. This number is consistent, um, hovering in the 50s. 65% reported that it was pre-installed, which is up from 2017. So of smartphone owners that responded to the survey that they had pre-installed Find Your Phone capabilities, 73% um, responded that they had already enabled it. And you'll see at the bottom there some of the reasons for not enabling it were um, they don't see a need for the capabilities, they didn't, haven't yet had time to set it up, or they're worried about accidentally locking or erasing uh, the mm -hmm. data from their device. I will point out that of the reasons that respondents said that would encourage them to enable these features, a troubling 34% said that their phone being lost or stolen would encourage them to um, adopt <laughs> these procedures. So, <laughs> you know, we'll too little to late, I suppose, <laughs> but, you know, next go round. Just hop back in the time machine and you know, get it installed exactly. and rerun the program. <laughs> Could you give it my phone back? <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, in the past year, 9% of the respondents reported having lost um, a personal smartphone. That is down from both 2017 and 2016, so that's good. And of the respondents who reported to have lost a smartphone, only 20% 20 per, 20 said that it had been stolen. The other 80% said that it had been misplaced. And so here are two charts that sort of show um, the decline in folks saying that the folk, their phones had been stolen as opposed to misplaced. This is a really good news chart. Yeah. Um, and then here is just a, uh, some statistics on what respondents said they did once a phone had been lost or stolen. Um, you know, had used the programs to locate their devices, 45% called the device to hear um, a vibration contacted an insurance carrier, contacted their providers, um, or disabled or wiped the device. So of those that responded that a device had been misplaced, 69%, uh, 90% percent ended up recovering it, which is up from 2017. And here you see they either found it in their home or another location or had it returned. Of those who um, reported that it had been stolen, 59% uh, still reported recovering it. And you see some through the assistance of law enforcement um, or through insurance coverage, which, you know, having recovered it through insurance coverage, I don't think indicates that they found the original device, but that they, you know, obtained a new device. And then here is another chart. And so I think two of the key takeaways, and this is my last slide, so two of the key takeaways are that um, uh, it's hovering around 57% those that n are aware that these capabilities exist on their smartphones and the numbers of respondents reporting that lost or s lost or stolen phones is down overall and also those that they're saying are stolen is down um, which is a promising statistic so we will continue on that first point to try and get the word out and more on focus on consumer education that these d tools are available on their devices and so with that, I will give time back and answer any questions. Amazing. Yes, absolutely amazing. <laughs> Melanie gets Speed the gold me. star for sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Pierre. Yeah, amazing presentation, amazing catch-up too. The thing that, that most puzzled me was the um, slide that our esteemed chair called the good news slide, um, which was, you know, all the numbers you talked about Thank are you. essentially flat. Statistically, nothing happened which is what you'd expect. And then you look at the percentage whose phones were stolen and they fell by half mm -hmm. in two years. That, I mean, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, d I don't want to question good news, but, um, you know, so I think that what we have also seen, these numbers sort of correlate with what we're hearing from law enforcement on the decline of smartphone thefts you know, they've all said um, around 50%. They've seen a, around a 50% decline. So, um, you know, we'll, we're still trying to work with folks throughout the law enforcement community to solidify those statistics and see if that decline has continued. But the anecdotal evidence that we've seen um, from some very large cities, including San Francisco, is that they're reporting that about a 50%. Uh, I, I would, I would, let, me, let me add just one other fact, because the, your charts don't go back from when we started this effort. Yes. If they did, the number of people using these features was far lower when we started oh, yeah. this. So if, if you want to look at, 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 I think we've reached stasis in terms of encouraging people to do this. There was a doubling of the adoption of these features with the changes that the manufacturers made. This may be the, the uh, cause of the effect. So, so there has been, in, in the full cycle here, going back five to six years, uh, we were down to around 30 percent in terms of the adoption of these features. That's gone way up. But so, with, so I mean, with, with the signal this strong, one should be able to show causation. So, are you, is, is that what well, well, I'm saying? This is the causation. So, I'm, so what, okay, so you just is it that the features are making it not worth stealing the most? Yeah, yeah, that's a possible. That, you know, you guess it, but that's a possibility. What, what I don't want to leave the impression is that nothing's changed. In, in the course of time in which we've worked with the industry in terms of making these opt-in versus opt-out features, right. we've at least doubled the, the usage of these capabilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that, that was a significant accomplishment. As noted in the survey, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the users actually appreciate the fact 
it comes turned on instead of having to figure out how to turn it on. That was a big that was a big change we made working with industry. And remember, there's a lag to Marty's point earlier. You, you start doing these things in phones. Well, we don't change our phones every six months. So there's a lag. I mean, some people like me still have phones from five years ago. So it, the effect will be cumulative over time as people do, like, like Julie, who gets new phones every week. You know, <laughs> they will have these features. Now that's a new Blackberry, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you see what your next work group is. <laughs> Leave it to Pierre. Well done. Well done. Well done. Okay. Ryan, continue. Maybe you can get us back on track. Well, I, I was just going to you know, support with what both you and Walter had said. I think you know, when we started out this initiative, um, you know, there was basically nothing in the handsets. And then we had the voluntary commitments. And, and as you said, over time, more and more handsets now have the capabilities yeah. that are out there as they're being replaced through normal attrition. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's definitely what we're seeing here, and, and the trend is, is very positive. Yeah, and, and, the in fact, and the database and the AI. And the database and everything AI else AI we're putting into place. And, 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 and I'll, I'll say one other thing, by the way. Um, about the time that we started this activity, I had been given for testing purposes an Android phone. I was aware of, you know, find my phone capabilities. Actually, actually I found it fairly complex figuring out on the Android of that year how to locate the features I needed, how to turn them on. I, I probably spent half an hour to 45 minutes running down, and, and I think I'm pretty good at this sort of thing, at least, yeah. at least better than the average person, all right? So uh, it's the, the change in ease of use of this is enormous. Uh, I think one of the questions we have to ask, I think we are at stasis with the current range of technologies of trying to understand better what we could do to improve this to get it even higher. So, uh, but e certainly it's ease of use seems to be, the, the, the negatives that come out, I don't like remembering passwords, I don't like doing, okay, so, so the hope of the new facial recognition technologies, uh, if they get broadly adopted, uh, or you can tie these features to other things people think are important. Another, th another important fact that came out from this, uh, a significant number of people are activating these because they're keeping data that they don't want other people to. They're keeping financial data, payment data, okay, and that makes it much more important to them just a phone. So these are things we have to think about for the future. Yeah, pl pl plus this has gotten a lot of international exposure as well over time, which well, I yeah, think. Yeah, Melanie didn't have a chance to talk about it. The international is totally different, and w there's another yeah. story there we'll be bringing out. Yeah. Good. Not seeing any tent cards up. We are really running just right on time here at this point. Uh, and now I will, w with that caveat that we're back on time, courtesy of Melanie's outstanding work on behalf of the rest of the team that may or may not have been on time. <laughs> 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 um, let, me, let me turn things to Julie to, to give his recap. I have 20 minutes of remarks. <laughs> <laughs> now, thanks all, all of you for all of your work. And thank you, Dennis, for running a terrific meeting and your steady hand for all the work. That's it. That's <laughs> quick and appreciated on behalf of the group. Walt, our designated federal. Yeah, but by the way, I, I've told a few of you this. I'll be retiring at the end of the year, so next. What? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and, and for those, um, it's really been a real privilege and an education working with you all. And I've appreciated uh, the time that you've spent. Certainly, it's been very generous. I, I, I know more than most of the amount of effort that uh, uh, people spend on this and the time that they spend on this. And uh, it's been education for me. Uh, uh, the participating in the work groups is both a chore as well as a benefit because if you really are, are, want to learn, uh, the, the contributions of the speakers coming in, what they have to present, if this could be turned into a sort of university course, it, it, would, <laughs> it, it, it would be wonderful. So I've enjoyed that aspect, and uh, I look forward to uh, my next stage in life, but it is, again, I'd like to thank you all. You're going to be here for the next meeting, aren't you? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. But I know it's the key. <laughs> it's going to get to do this all over again next meeting. Okay. Yeah.
So no, I, I was actually <laughs> debating whether or not I should share that news, uh, but we, I think, I speak for all of us, we will enormously miss you, Walt, because uh, you've been absolutely a guiding light for this group. and. And he is the one person that attends more meetings than any of the rest of us because he sits as the liaison or one of the liaisons for so many of the groups, but always there and always the go-to person whenever we have any observations, uh, as in observations of what should be done better. And Walt, why haven't you fixed it? It's <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's it's really a, a challenging job. It really is, but. He makes it seem easy by doing so well with it. So again, we will enormously miss you. While I'm giving out the bouquets, just a, a few more, uh, certainly to the chairs and co-chairs and to the, the subcommittee chairs. We've really been one of the exciting parts for a long time with the TAC that we have so many people engaged in leading our groups. And then, of course, adding to that the rest of the TAC members who are not serving in that capacity but are very actively involved in contributing and, and certainly these are busy days for all of us uh, but there has been enormous contributions made certainly always looking for more but uh, this has been a, a tremendous hallmark of this group adding to our number as the TAC itself the official TAC we have quite a number of subject matter experts who have volunteered their time to serve on the working groups and that's really been fantastic if you look at the list that were displayed so quickly today quite a number of the people on the working group lists are not sitting at this table or even uh, absent from sitting at this table they're, they're rather subject matter experts that come in and contribute to a specific group in a in a very very significant way and then even beyond those on the group there are the subject matter experts who have spoken to our groups and maybe it's only one time but uh, each of them, having listened to so many of them, they're all enthusiastic. Sure, you can use our presentation. If you have any questions, send them to me. If you want me to come back, I'd be happy to do so. And, and that, that really is an enormous value that, that comes as well. While I'm uh, thanking the group here, I, I want to also thank the liaisons. There are, if you counted them up, there are 16 liaisons for us who really do help steer the ship for each of the working groups and, and help with the process as you recognize the process. We are an advisory group to the FCC and a lot of the advice comes out in this meeting, but a lot of the advice, if you will, or contributions are made courtesy of the liaisons who are absorbing the information, sometimes guiding the information that's developed and then bringing it by virtue of their uh, space between their ears into the, the FCC and then using it in their day-to-day -day activities. And that's a, a significant advantage, but it significantly advantages us as a TAC by having them at the group and being able to share in the, uh, in the uh, reverse direction the interesting things that are going on at the FCC that are pertinent to the working groups that, that you all inhabit. Um, finally, I've already thanked Wal, but I do I uh, want to thank Julie as well, because Julie certainly is guiding light and interposer between Walt too, uh, between this group and the eighth floor team that are uh, absorbing so much of this information as digested by uh, particularly these guys, but also the, the folks uh, that are the liaisons. Uh, another thanks back to Jack. We'll bracket the thanks on the food. Uh, really appreciate that from Qualcomm standpoint. Um, We'll point out to you our final meeting of our 20th year is December the 5th at 10 a.m. It's an elongated meeting um, to be able to, to share those actionable recommendations. This is the time to come forward, and, and we're really pretty much on schedule. You've we delivered in November, by the way. Yes, which, uh, <laughs> as, yeah, uh, we, we do have the, the request for an early delivery, so. And what is the date for that delivery? A month before, so it's a nominally November 10th. Okay, so November 10th. Um, doesn't mean you can't polish a little bit from there, but the, the, the general themes, uh, so this, this is only, you know, six or seven weeks that 
we have at this point. So it is good that we are at a place where we have draft versions of, of where each of the groups are. But it's coming up fast, and again, the, the good news, bad news, gee, the eighth floor isn't paying attention, there was a historic concern. Now the eighth floor is paying lots of attention, and now it's, oh man, you know, by pay, paying attention, they're requiring us to do things <laughs> a little earlier, a little more stringently. But it, I, it, again, I, I applaud that. Um, final item that is just to remind you that we do have the 20th anniversary celebration. So I'm sure background, you've been background processing the notions of what we might do for that. Uh, and even though we only have half a sheet cake, maybe you can think about what we could put on that. And, and the three balloons, maybe we could put something on the three balloons that Julie has offered to provide. Uh, now, being serious about this, uh, I think there are contributions, uh, different things, artifacts, if you will, of the 20 years, uh, little stories, vignettes, or even white papers that were particularly significant that you'd like to bring the cover page and make it a part of our celebratory activities. Those are just starter thoughts, because uh, we really should make this a, a big deal celebration, and since he's since he's already pointed it out, there's <coughs> this, I was going to kind of keep this quiet, but we might think about this as a celebratory activity for somebody who's going to be retiring and leaving our midst as well. So yes. that That's would, what I'm celebrating. That was, <laughs> <laughs> celebrating leaving us? I can't believe he said that. Uh, no. No. So it, it is something to, to be thinking about because we, we will miss Walter, for sure. Any final comments from anyone around the table? Final comments on the phone? Well, much as I hate to, to let you out four minutes early, I guess we will, we will do so. And again, this is totally attributable to Melanie, so <laughs> as you wish to thank people for getting us, keeping us on time, don't thank me, thank Melanie. <laughs> <laughs>